the first talk starts in 10 minutes, so we'll have a bit of time if people want to try things out. Um, we need to go through the slides, but let's see, I think a few people are still joining. Maybe just wait one minute. Matrix seems to be stable today, so hopefully it's going to be smooth. <laughs> okay, let's get started with uh, the standard slide. So welcome to the testing and fuzzing microconference. I'm Guillaume Tucker from Colabra, and we have uh, Sasha Levin from Google as MC leads. So we have to go through a few uh, admin things first. Well, there's the uh, the list of sponsors, so uh, we need to say thank you to all our sponsors who've made LPC possible this year. So we have um, Starman sponsor, we have Facebook, Platinum sponsor, we have IBM, uh, Gold sponsors, we have Arm and Microsoft, and Silver sponsors, we have Amazon uh, Web Services, Netflix and Red Hat, and Speaker Gift sponsor is Collabora. T-shirt sponsor, and I'm wearing a full T-shirt, but still there's some T-shirts available, is VMware. <laughs> and conference services, the Linux Foundation. Uh, Anti-harassment policy, I think you can read this on the main website, but here it's more to remind people that it's there, and please bear it in mind. Um, yeah, okay, so housekeeping. So basically everybody should have um, the microphone and camera muted, except when you are talking or when you have a question. So if you have a question, you can un unmute your camera or microphone and people will notice you're here. Um, there's a hand button at the bottom of the screen, but usually that goes completely unnoticed. So it's much better to just unmute your your um, video or sound if you want to, to talk. Okay. Um, and then yeah, there's the list of uh, planning committees. So thank you, for, thank you to all the committee for making this possible. And this is the <laughs> we're not quite on a break yet. <laughs> um, so now is a good time if anybody has any questions, like any problems joining or general uh, comments about testing and fuzzing microconference, what it is going to be about. Does anybody? I'll just. Anything? Yep. I'll just note that our schedule is really packed this year, so we're really going to be strict on the um, um, timelines, and we might need to cut folks off. If that does happen, uh, feel free to take it to a breakout room or continue discussion on chat or whatever works for you. This is uh, merely a starting point for a larger discussion. It doesn't have to be the end of it. I can't find my cards from last year with the five minute warning things, but um, we'll probably put some messages on, on, on the chat or just jump in. So could we do a test? Uh, so I have some a PDF now for my slides. So I'm wondering if I can, rather than sharing my screen, I could just use BBB's uh, um, way of doing it. Yes. Um, yeah, if you want to try to upload, you can upload your file now, and then it will be ready just when you start. So the first talk is in five minutes. We have the time to do that if you want. Yeah, well, I've already uploaded the slides, so. Yeah, but um, okay. Uh, that would be super helpful for me as well. Uh, yeah, I think my talk is the first one. Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah, I've already uploaded the yours. yeah, yeah. I've already uploaded the the, the one for the sys verifier, so it's already there. Okay. But we can preload uh, Martin's talk as well. So the one for the first talk is. This one, 
is this the right version? I got it from the from the um, schedule. Um, yes, I made some slight updates today, but uh, if it's the same one, yes. Uh, well, I just downloaded it like five minutes ago. Oh, then that's perfect. Okay, cool. Then where's Martin? Here. Yeah. Martin, you now presenter, you should be able to upload your PDF if you want, and then we'll be ready ahead of time. You click on plus and manage presentations, and you should be able to do upload. I see the Zoom, but I don't see a plus anywhere. In bottom left corner. Hmm. I don't see anything. There's just download the original presentation. Oh, I see you've put your PDF on the yeah. website. So, okay, so I can download that. It's just, uh, yeah, Nikolai's presentation is not there yet. So, Nikolai, if you have a PDF, you can upload it and then uh, we'll preload it. So this one is for Martin. I see Mara and I have the, the same uh, style. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was a template for LPC, but maybe maybe nobody's using it. Anyway, what's important it's is what's it's inside this. It's very important. <laughs> okay. We can maybe get started with uh, the first presentation, given that. Yeah. It's okay. yeah. So I give presentation to Mara. Okay, so now you should be able to uh, change the slides. Um, yeah. yeah, I am. Okay, cool. cool. Um, can I start? Um, yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Mara, um, and today I'm going to present you an idea I worked on during my Google internship to uh, together with Dimitri Vukov and Marco Elver on how to detect semantic bugs uh, using differential fuzzing. So, detecting many classes of bugs is easy uh, due to the way they affect the system. Uh, they either cause a they either cause assertion failures, crash the system, or trigger some form of undefined behavior, which is detectable using existing analysis tools. Um, however, semantic bugs are quite different because while they make a program operate incorrectly and may might produce might make the program produce an intended output, uh, they do this uh, with the possibility that the program might not crash or trigger assertion failures which makes it impossible for uh, existing analysis tools to detect semantic bugs, and it requires the developer to go in and manually inspect and test the program. So how can we find semantic bugs? Um, one way to do this is by using a system specification, which is a way of formalizing a system's intended behavior. And this can be used as a baseline for writing tests. However, um, this gets more complicated to achieve as the size of the system increases because more and more tests need to be added and uh, they become more complex. And also some existing large systems have no centralized specification available. So if we take the Linux kernel, for example, we can consider its specification the union of documentation found in several resources, man pages, and the implied expectations of user programs. And while there are test suits available to detect regressions, 
uh, they require a lot of engineering effort to extend and maintain. Um, so how can we automate this? One way of doing it is by using differential fuzzing. And differential fuzzing automates the detection of semantic bugs by providing the same input to different imp implementations of the same system uh, and cross comparing the resulting behaviors. And if the system disagrees, we can say uh, that at least one of them is wrong. Maybe, maybe both of them are wrong. Um, and this idea works quite well for simple deterministic systems for such as JSON parser, regex engines, or compilers. Um, and since to the best of our knowledge, there is no tool that uh, automatically detects semantic bugs for the kernel, we want to try to do this for, for the Linux kernel. However, this is not trivial due to the several technical challenges that we need to take into account. Uh, first of them, uh, first of them is kernel non-determinism, uh, which is caused by several factors, and each of them would can cause uh, false positives in the result that needs to be separate, uh, need to be accounted for separately. Um, the second challenge is implementation-defined behavior, which occurs uh, due to undocumented changes that get uh, that get altered from version to version, and. Finally, considering that the input of a differential fuzzing engine for the kernel is a sequence of system call, if we take into account all the possible combinations of system calls and their arguments, um, we can say that the state space of the input is unbounded. Um, moreover, in order to make differential fuzzing useful for, for the kernel, we need to choose the right comparison candidates. Um, so the right uh, different implementations to compare. And there are several pairs that we can that are worth discussing. Um, first of all, we can compare an LTS with mainline, and this could be a way of preventing bugs from reaching the next release. Uh, then we could compare different LTS releases. However, we need to be careful how far apart these these are, because if they're too close to each other, there won't be many in intentional differences to whitelist. But probably most bugs are. Um, uh, are present in both versions. However, if they're too far apart, uh, we need a very thorough mechanism to whitelist all in intentional differences. Um, we can also compare minor LTS updates to ensure that bugs that are claimed to be fixed by the update are actually fixed. And probably the most interested would be uh, different kernel implementations, for example, Linux versus Gvisor, because this could uncover real semantic bugs. Uh, however, this is uh, quite challenging due to uh, all the false positive caused by intentional differences that we need to account for. And our solution is a tool called Sys Verifier, which currently provides differential fuzzing for the Linux kernel. Um, and it's part of the Syscaller project uh, that additionally provides unsupervised coverage guided kernel fuzzing. And the way this uh, Sys Verifier works uh, is by generating a continuous stream of random programs, which are sequences of system call, uh, that are first uh, dispatched uh, for execution on different versions of the Linux kernel. And then after the programs have finished executing, the, program, the programs are gathered and ve verified. And currently for each system call, we gather the error notes and uh, uh, information about the, whether the VM has crashed executing the program. And when, if, when, if, when cross comparing the results, um, we find mismatches in the error notes returned, SysVerifier creates an execution report that can be used for further inspection. Um, I will now give a quick overview of the architecture of SysVerifier. Um, so at the host level, uh, when the main utility is started, this will spawn several virtual machines that will each um, run a different version of the Linux kernel, and this can be con configured by the user. Uh, and then it will start generating a continuous stream of programs that will reach the run a runner component on the virtual machine. And the runner component is responsible for turning the program into input um, to the program executor uh, that will then execute the program, which is triggering system calls in the kernel. Um, and then we'll gather results and send them back to the host. And when the host has received uh, results from all the kernels, uh, it will cross compare them, and in case a mismatch is found, it will write the a report to persistent storage, and it will also gather statistics about execution. And statistics are important in order to see the system calls that are the most problematic. Uh, 
both in case of true positives and false positives. Um, and in order to establish whether the returns, the results reported by CIS verifier are actually true positives, um, we did some bisection of mismatches found. Uh, and I'm going to present you a few examples. Uh, one of them is uh, on the IOU ring setup. So uh, this is a system call that operates on uh, ring queues that share data between the kernel and the user space to avoid uh, duplication. And on the old kernel, uh, the system call was returning bad file descriptor, while on the new kernel, it was returning no such device or address. And by section led us to this commit, uh, which shows that the change was actually made. However, this change is not documented uh, in the in the commit description. So it might or might not be a bug. Uh, then an example of uh, uh, another true positive is for perf event open. So perf event is an event based tool for performance and troubleshooting. Uh, and the old kernel was returning argument list too long while the new kernel was returning a valid argument. And by section led us to this commit, uh, which basically shows us that the new kernel has had the system called description with an, an additional argument. And this is actually an, in, an in, this is actually an, an example of an intentional change that needs to be whitelisted in the architecture of sys verifier in order to not cause uh, false positives. Um, now, uh, as I said, in the kernel, there are several sources of non-determinism that need to be accounted for, and I'm going to uh, talk about several implementation details that we opted for in order to remove some of them. Uh, first, we favor we are favoring single threaded mode in program execution uh, to avoid system calls failing because of a previous one that they depend on uh, hasn't executed yet. So, for example, if we have a program where we have an open and a write operating on the same same file descriptor, if the program is executing concurrently and the write is gonna uh, it's going to uh, execute before the open, it will fail because it's trying to write to an invalid file descriptor. Uh, however, this sacrifices some true positives uh, by eliminating concurrency. Uh, then we want all programs to start from an initial clean state. Uh, so we create a new working and process directory, new set of namespaces and uh, new C groups in order to avoid false positives occurring because of accumulated hidden state. Um, and finally, we only considered mismatches that are returned deterministically. So we rerun programs uh, in order to eliminate flake mismatches that are caused either by the current state of the system, by background activity, or some other factors. Um, and SysVerifier is still in the prototype stage, so there is a lot of work to be done on it. Uh, first, we want to research and eliminate other sources of false positives because there probably are several of them. Um, it would be super useful to provide automatic bisection of the of mismatches. Uh, it would be also interesting to extend the return state um, of each system call to include information about memory, registers, contents of disk, uh, privileges assigned to system calls, as this would be a way, for example, to unveil memory corruption. Uh, as I said before, uh, we could compare Linux with other kernels on a subset of system calls, or we cr can create an execution model of a subsystem of the Linux kernel to compare against in order to automate the process of finding some bugs in new releases. Um, so, to summarize, um, semantic bugs are bad because uh, are bad because they're di very difficult to find. Differential fuzzing is a way to automate the process of finding semantic bugs. Uh, and sys verifier is a differential fuzzing prototype for the Linux kernel. Uh, below you have the link to the main repository. Sys verifier was built as part of the syscaller repository. Uh, the link will take you to a more uh, detailed documentation also on how to run the tool and how to interpret the reports, uh, the reports returned. Um, and it also contains the, all the code. Um, thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? Yeah, I'm curious how big the whitelist you mentioned you ended up with. Um, I can only assume there's. I'd argue that that the specs aren't just the docs and the code. It's also only what users actually care about, um, and, and I can assume that a lot of changes in Ernos are no one cares about them. They're fine. 
which would lead to a massive whitelist and I'm curious how big it ended up being on your end. Um, so we prioritized on uh, based on the statistics um, and at the current point in order to uh, verify that whether a, a mismatch is due to an intentional change that needs to be whitelisted or a bug, we basically had to uh, go through um, all the all the mismatches returned. Uh, we found, yeah, we found several several things that need to be whitelisted. For example, like a perf event was a tool that uh, was a subsystem that has seen a lot of changes um, in the near past that need to be whitelisted. Uh, so we mostly looked at ways to to get rid of non non determinism rather than whitelisting things because whitelisting would be easier to to do while like in the moment we integrate automatic bisection in the tool hey this is ky um a great presentation so as part of fuzzing what changes uh, the order of system calls changes or the arguments are going to be uh, changing uh, across the entire spectrum of valid and also invalid arguments. So what's the space of uh, the, the overall uh, test space for the system calls? Um, so we use the declarative uh, uh, language for describing system calls that is also used by Syscaller, uh, which gives a description of the system call with and constrains arguments to what would be interesting. Uh, in the same time, avoids arguments that we know would from the beginning would be invalid for the system calls. Uh, the, the language we used for generating programs is called syslang, uh, and you can find a lot more information on it uh, in the syscaller repository because it's also used in syscaller for generating test programs. Okay, so actually from run to run, uh, the programs that are generated will actually be uh, using arguments that are uh, different and- uh, have Yes, completely random. Completely we, random and covering yeah. the entire space of uh, what those arguments can take. Yes, uh, we can, for example, uh, syslang allows us to restrict the set of system calls to uh, smaller or a larger one depends on what we want to do so for example from the start we've eliminated system calls that cause concurrency from the set of system calls that are used in generating programs thank you have you uh, have you considered running this on like the um, stable trees um, because i would assume there is less noise between different stable tree releases versus upstream releases because you kind of ignore merge windows where most of the intentional changes of that sort happen um so we've only run it on stable releases uh we've only compared stable re like stable releases between each other so far Oh, sorry, my headphones died. Could you repeat, please? Sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, sorry. So far, we've compared it only on stable releases of the Linux kernel, uh, mostly focusing from 5.13, and 5.10. Like that's the area we've uh, oh. we've compared. Uh, we initially went to 5.13 versus 5.12 because we expected to not have many mismatches there and most of them to be due to intentional differences. So it was, they were very good comparison candidates in order to eliminate the sources of non-determinism that were causing the most problems. So you said you were uh, gathering, I'm sorry, go ahead, Sasha. I was thinking like between releases of the same series, so like 5.13.1, 5.13.2, and so on, and kind of just make sure that um, we're in the same release. No, uh, we didn't compare them as close to each other because um, 
I, I, I started going further and further until the point I got mismatches and comparing such close um, um, releases didn't um, unveil any mismatches very quickly. And yeah, it also depends on what programs are generated, obviously. Right. And you need to find the system call, exactly the system calls that are problematic in, this two, in those two releases. Right. Okay. So, so I have a, another question. So since you said that the, the parameters are all already known to be uh, valid parameters in the sense that um, all, all parameters are valid because if the parameters are invalid, <clears throat> we expect appropriate error codes to come back and we shouldn't crash the system or anything. So every parameter is valid. And so now uh, as you have compared these various kernels, uh, you talked about uh, known differences. Uh, have real bugs been identified? And if there's such a list of real bugs, uh, can you point us to a, uh, a page that lists uh, what bugs have been actually found with this test and what we have done about it? Um, so we started working on the tool um, the beginning of June. Uh, it's in a very early stage so far. Okay. So we haven't, we haven't, we think that there still needs to be a lot of work done on the tool in order to then be able to claim for sure that bugs are actually bugs. Okay, thank uh, you. Just to say there are a couple of questions on the chat. Are you able to see the chat? Uh, would be good yes, if you could so. read the questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, it's loading. I okay. Um, is there some implicit specification that certain Erno can be replaced by others and still consider it backwards compatible? Uh, not supported can be replaced by any value at a later version. Um, I I'm not sure. Um, we've like in the misma, in the bisections we've done, we wanted to make sure that the changes that were causing mismatches were actually mentioned in the commit descriptions we were pointed to. So maybe Dimitri or Marco has uh, have something to say about this, but um, I I I'm not sure. Um, then, did you already consider coverage guidance using the coverage data from multiple VMs and make the corpus grow to increase coverage on the kernels of multiple VMs? Um, uh, so far, we're not working with coverage. Um, we haven't, yeah, we haven't integrated that feature in differential uh, in our tool. Um, maybe uh, since. Dimitri and Mark are contributors to Syscaller. They can also add more on this. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. So I, I can provide some maybe additional comments on this implicit specification. So there is none that we are aware of. Um, yeah, there are some obvious candidates like what you mentioned, not supported. Maybe um, Eno TTI uh, versus something else is also white listed, but we're not aware of any um, actual specification. For, for for all of those cases. Thank you. Um, and then the question from Martin. Um, I I understand that fuzzing is a never ending process, but we are talking about one hour, one day, or one week. Um, most runs, because we were in such an initial stage, most runs. Uh, like gave us results even after less than 30 minutes because at the beginning we had a lot of mismatches due to um, false 
uh, due to false positive caused by concurrency and uh, accumulated state. Um, and by af and then afterwards, after eliminating those, um, and after whitelisting things like perf event open uh, and disable system calls that create um, that create concurrency. Um, for example, when comparing Linux 13 with Linux 12, uh, we didn't get, we got very few mismatches. So it really depends on whether the programs that are generated uh, call, are going to cause some mismatches, uh, whether we are triggering some sort of false positives. Uh, but especially initially, we got results very quickly. I don't. It, we never let this verifier run for one day or one week in order to get results because we got them we got some useful reports way faster than that thank you yeah i guess the question was how long do you think it would take to get some meaningful results in in the future when the tool has been proven to work um so Depends on how much, obviously depends on the resources and how much parallelism we can get running. Uh, so, for example, for Syscaller, I know we can get meaningful results even in within a day. So I presume it's going to be possible for Sysverifier. It always depends on the amount of resources and the versions we are comparing. Okay. Um, well, because I presume, like I presume that a new, very, like new version with a very old version will produce results very quickly because there, as I said, there probably would be intentional differences. Yeah, I guess the reason why I was asking this is, um, as Sasha was thinking, um, in the stable releases, as in like five point thirteen dot x we don't want to introduce any changes there that would be, you know, a semantic change. So that would be a very um, a nice place to actually use this differential further. further. And uh, so there are new releases, let's say, at first it's a couple of times a week and then it, it dies down more like once a week. So that that's definitely doable to run something for a day and, and try to catch something. It's like, a last effort, really last thing to try to find differences and, and review them. Um, so, yeah, that's very good work and that could be very, very useful. We have, uh, we have two minutes left uh, before the next talk. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have you considered any other metrics to, me to measure behavior other than the um, syscall air nose? Um, so there is uh, some syscaller internal there are some syscaller internal flags that we worked on which were a good indicator especially in the concurrency um, aspect to see whether a system call has executed uh, or not because for example um, if we had the write followed by a read and the read was taking place uh, before the write due to concurrency it, we could cl clearly see that for example the uh, system call would block uh, in case of a pipe. Um, other metrics uh, that would be useful could appear when we extend the return state. Uh, we've considered uh, checking whether a system call alters memory in, in the same way uh, by looking at the memory area in our discussions, but we haven't gotten so far. Hi. Uh, so we considered using some other things, as Mara mentioned. Um, the good question is if we actually need to do this or not, because um, other things can also be sensed with uh, system caller return values. For example, if there is I don't know, an additional file on the on the disk, then calling open on that file uh, in the program will return different um, different result if this file is present or not. Uh, so potentially 
all of the other things can actually be sensed by looking just at the system color return values. Yeah, but um, potentially using other things may increase efficiency. Maybe that's that's a good research question. Yes, thank you. It's now sorry, but it's now time for Martin's talk. Um, I guess we can continue discussion on on the chat or in, in the hacking room if you want to. Uh, Martin, are you ready? Yes, I am ready, and I think my webcam is ready too. Okay, and thank you, Mario, for your talk. That was great. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about bare metal testing and why container uh, containers could actually help increase testing. So my name is wait a second. Martin Roca. Uh, some people might know me under Martin Perez. I just got married this year, uh, and so a lot of people are not aware of this for good reasons. <laughs> so I'm now a freelancer. I used to work with Intel before, and I am a valve contractor. So uh, I need to get used to this. So I am very active in the graphics subsystem. I used to be on the Xorg of, di Xorg of uh, board of directors. And my focus at first was on Nuvo, the NVIDIA graphic driver, then Intel, and then AMD. So my mission is to get production ready upstream Linux. That means that any new release of Linux will be runnable in production in any system. So basically, we want to make sure that there are no regressions and automated testing is a very effective way to do this. So my experience on this has been uh, with Intel graphics, especially where we are running a, an integration uh, testing um, test suite called IGT, that is, uh, well, um, it's integration testing. So there's a lot of false positives and things like this. And so I wrote a tool to to remove false positives, to document what are the, the known issues and, and address so-called flakes. So that means that you run the test suite twice on the same uh, same kernel and you get different outputs and that can be due to concurrency or any other things and then i also have uh written a tool uh, called easybench that is an auto bisector for performance unit tests or image changes so if you run let's say a graphic driver and you run a, a trace of a game you want to make sure that the game looks the same and if it if the output changes then you want to bisect that so easybench was doing this and i'm working again on making something like this for valve so why do we need to care about rootfs generation so if you really want to prevent regressions in linux then you really need to run a lot of test suites on a lot of different hardware so you, you want to make it as easy as possible to um to run these test suites the problem is that we have different hardware in different ci farms so there's no one farm to rule them all that that would have absolutely everything so that's one problem. And then the different CI farms have different interfaces or requirements on how to run, um, well, how to run tests. So, uh, or finally, if we were to reboot um, the, the test machines every time we want to run a new test suite, that might be taking a lot of time or at least wasting uh, valuable machine time just because, you know, the, we didn't want to make one root FS with absolutely everything, and we instead have one root FS per um, test suite. And yeah, so for graphics, we have a lot of different test suites, and the dependencies there are also very tricky uh, to to get. And and maintaining a root FS is not a trivial task. It's not just install this package. So um, that's a reason why uh, making root FS generation as easy as possible is, is a good idea. And yeah, basically, since we want to run as many test suites as possible in the CI system, we want to make adding new test suites as easy as possible. And now we're going to go into uh, comparing uh, the current way of doing, um, well, basically of deploying new tests and uh, what if it were used by an OCI container or deployed using OCI. So, uh, I call rootfs the traditional method of deploying the test environment. And then 
the OCI container is usually uh, found for unit testing and in the web world. When I say unit testing, I mean like GitHub Actions or GitLab uh, CI. When you run tests, you are packaging your tests uh, as a container or at least the tests run also in a container. Then, uh, so for the rootfs, they are usually created using Yocto, build root, or kernel CI rootfs tool. It can be also DevOS, VR to build. There's a lot of tools uh, on the Open CI, um, Open Container Initiative containers. We have Docker, Podman, or Builder. Docker was the original one. The others are well, also pretty good. Then uh, one big difference between the two is that the rootfs is generating a self-contained uh, full disk image, which means that if you need to flash this image, you need to reflash absolutely everything. You don't do differential flashing, for instance. And the portability can be a bit uh, uh, bad because if you have multiple boards that have different requirements for modules or firmwares, then well, either you make one rootfs that has absolutely everything, or um, you'll need to um, make one rootfs per device that uh, that you want to boot. Whereas, um, so with the container side, that's the biggest difference. Instead of generating a full disk image, you have a set of overlays. Uh, so that means that, for instance, you can have as a as a layer your base Debian system. Then on top of this, you have uh, the dependencies for running any graphics workload. And then you can have as a last layer, which uh, test suite you want to have with the latest version of it. And this way, if you have two containers that um, that use the, the, la the previous two layers, then you don't need to retransfer them because they are already on the device. So that means that you don't need two full disk images. And so because of this, um, it is faster to deploy and, um, and it is very portable because basically there's no platform setup. The platform setup needs to be done before, which is can be viewed as an inconvenient, but we're going to see that it's not necessarily that bad. So an additional point is uh, for containers is that you already wrote these containers for unit testing in GitHub or GitLab. So why not reuse that? for bare metal testing. That would be very useful. The problem is that how do we boot to a container? Uh, since, as, as I said, we need to have um, initialization of the platform, for instance, setting the network IP or setting the time, mounting um, um, the, the, the drives for storage. This sort of thing needs to be done. So do we need to make another rootfs just to be able to load containers? Well, not really. <laughs> I've been working on this tool for quite a while now. I mean, basically this year, it's called Boot to Container. And what is it? Uh, what it is, is a um, small init RAM FS that you can easily uh, uh, pixie boot. So that means um, network boot. Uh, it has a declarative configuration using the kernel command line. And there are quite a lot of features. Uh, so First thing is, of course, containers require internet access. So DHCP and setting the time using MTP is important. Then we can uh, store the, um, um, well, basically we have a cache drive that can be used for caching the layers, but also caching data that, that is used for testing. And we can have auto selection of the cache drive, auto formatting, and we can also select a swap file or say that I want to create a swap file of, of this much and, and mount it, or not mount it, but swap on it. And then you can create volumes. Um, so uh, container volume is, is a bit like creating a partition. Um, and so when, one interesting thing that we can do with Ubuntu container is that we can sync the content of a um, so-called bucket from, let's say, Amazon S3 or anything, anything compatible with it. And you can basically download files to the drive of the machine, run your test, and then sync back these files to this Amazon cloud or, you know, anything else, MinIO or something like this. And uh, it also supports local encryption. So 
if you want the files to remain confidential um, on your test machine, you can. And only if you provide the key, the FS script key, um, then your job uh, can access these files otherwise. Well, it's just encrypt encrypted blobs. And finally, you can also specify an expiration so you can say when you want the files to be deleted. Um, so that's practical. And it's time to give an example. Uh, if you want to run the IGT test suite that I was mentioning before using this tool, uh, this init from a test boot to container, here is the entire command line you need to set. Uh, this, of course, is, is like it's a template, so you would need to actually write uh, these uh, values, but then this can be auto generated by your infrastructure. So let's dive right in. So here we say that just select a cache device. Like you could say, say that I want to use dev as the A1, but here it's just like pick anything, I don't care. Then for NTP, it's the same. You just say use like the auto NTP server. So yeah, whatever. Then uh, let's not look at this line just yet. Um, then we say, I want to create a volume. So volume was like a partition. I want you to mirror from uh, a place called job, which is defined here. So job is it's just a nickname or an alias uh, from a cloud storage at this URL using this username and this password. And so then we just say like, well, uh, so from this endpoint, we want to use uh, the bucket name uh, for the job. So this is, again, something that is usually randomly generated. I want you to pull the data from this job bucket at the beginning of the, the so-called testing pipeline. And then every time there's a change that is happening on the file, I want you to push it to the uh, job bucket. So this way we can see if the machine crashes, we can have intermediate files. And then I want you to delete this mirror, uh, uh, this uh, volume at the end of the execution. Very good. Then there are two B2C container um, parameters. Basically what it says is, first I want you to run this container and then this one. And then for the people who are used to running Docker or Podman, then basically this is the Podman command line and same here. So for this one, this is an example. Um, in our case, we verify that the machines are in the state that we are expecting them to be. So this container is just gonna check that it is the case. And if it fails, then this container is not gonna be run. But if this succeeds, then the next one is executed. And we say, hey, I want you to use the job partition or volume, and I want you to mount it in slash results. Then here is the address for the IGT um, uh, container. Then I want you to run the IGT runner command from this container, and I want you to uh, well, write the results to slash results. And that's it. This is literally how you run a test suite. And then the console and all this, this is just a, a way to um, uh, put things using um, uh, a serial console. So um, if you want to add another test suite after this one, well, just add another B2C container command and you don't even need to make the container yourself as, as I've shown here. The container is just the upstream one and we can use the same one for uh, unit testing or the real hardware. So one issue that, that we found out with containers um, is that if you have a very limited amount of, uh, of RAM, then that's not going to work too well because generally it, it does use a bit more RAM and same with storage. So generally I would say like if you have less than 64 megs of RAM, then that starts being a little bit problematic. Although Podman is, is not too bad in, in memory usage if you're using uh, C run rather than run C but which is what I'm doing anyway. And then I have more open questions. So now that we could be sharing the containers between the different CI systems, we would also need a way to report these results in a standardized format so we can 
well, basically run this standard test container um, in any form we want and get the results. And, and then it doesn't really matter, you know, where the, the hardware is, we can queue work anyway. So there is such a format that exists already, it's called GUnit, but it's more like for Java testing. So the output is um, like the logs, for instance, collected or just STD out, STDR, but then kernel logs are like, eh, not really. So this is something that um, um, that could be uh, added there, or I don't know, like we come up with our own system, uh, our own format or something like this. And uh, that is it. Thanks for listening. And I'm waiting for questions if you have any. Thanks, Guy. Hi, Martin. I have a question on the kind of the early boot part of boot to container. How are you handling devices that need, for example, modules in a RAM disk before actually even having networking and stuff like that? Because obviously you want, you need networking for all this stuff to work. Right? Yes. <laughs> Very good question. So I have been cheating and basically the kernel that we give is already having everything built in, including the firmwares, but um, I have a to-do um, to basically have, well, I guess anyway, mm, well, I guess we'll, we have to anyway have the, the network firmware and the network uh, driver built in. But after this, all the other modules could be downloaded as a volume. So you would specify in the boot to container uh, com uh, kernel command line say i want you to mount this firmware volume and then this also this um, module volume and then load the, these firm these modules uh, at boot so that could be a way to share the same kernel but not have everything built in your kernel just because you want to have uh, you want to boot on literally the entire world so that's the current um, solution that i have so for, for kernel CI, we have a, a kind of a minimum Debian RAM disk that can actually have modules in it and then essentially do a pivot route. So I, I wondered if boot to container might be a project to kind of standardize on such a RAM disk as well, because that, that would be needed for the variety of hardware that we'd want to do this on, it could be needed. Yeah, um, so boot to container is based on U root uh, or micro root. So this is, this has been very easy to work with. Right now, most of the code is a shell script, but we are planning on re rewriting it in Go because shell scripts. <laughs> uh, and we want to have a bit more control uh, on you know, what to do in case of errors, but we're not really good Go programmers, so we just went for, uh, let's get something that works, prove that the entire pipeline or the entire infra that we had envisioned uh, can work and then uh, make new versions that, that would be, uh, you know, m more reliable. But so far it's been, it's been pretty reliable and we have uh, both integration testing and unit testing there. So uh, yeah, regressions are, are not really happening. <laughs> okay, thank you. So you're welcome, thanks Kevin. Uh, we have a question from Shoragan. How do you push the kernel command line to the test devices from the GitLab CI run? Well, that is a good question. So if you're using PXC, uh, so make basically network boot, you can say, um, so let's say that you're using IPXC uh, to, to boot, then you, you can have a DNS mask running in a server that will serve IPXC um, over the network then you're going to have the BIOS or your firmware basically loading this. And then IPC is then going to uh, uh, query the configuration for the machine. And what it downloads is basically a script. And the script is saying where to download your kernel and it's HTTP, so you can download through HTTP. Same for the initramfs and the kernel command line. So that's, that's all you need, really. 
and uh, how to set it up and how to share things, uh, how to share the machine between different, uh, well, let's say CI systems or different jobs. Uh, this is uh, the job of so-called the Valdin prop, <laughs> what we've been working on. Uh, but I didn't want to get to it because we didn't have that much time. But if you're interested, definitely hit me up. I'll, I'll send you all the links. But basically, it's it's normal netboot. There's there's nothing crazy here. In when you netboot, you can say what kernel, what uh, init from fs, and what uh, command line you want to use. I had a question, if that's okay. Um, maybe you covered this in your talk already. Uh, I, I was sort of following, well, following other talks because there's so many interesting topics today. Um, just wondering if you had plans to integrate this feature into QMU, because I think that uh, that would be incredible. Oh, you do? Well, I didn't have to do it. <laughs> Someone else did. Uh, so at, um, so uh, at freestop, um, freestop.org, uh, there is a project called CI Template. And um, so they've been using QMU a lot to, um, to boot containers. Uh, or oh, actually not to boot containers. They've been using QMU to do some, some testing, but then uh, they had to create their root FS and it's been a pain. And uh, so they are now working on using boot to container to, well, to basically standardize on using containers for testing everything. And um, so the integration is not that complex. The only thing that is a bit weird compared to a normal machine is if you want to share files to um, to the uh, the guest, then basically you need to first have boot to container partition the drive for you, then you mount the drive, then you copy your files, and then you unload and um, uh, and then you start again the machine. It's not very nice, but uh, if you know like what is expected for the the storage, basically it's just a label and a partition. If you do that on your own, then you don't need to make this this dance. Uh, but yeah, the, the goal is that for freedesktop.org, um, if you wanted to uh, do testing using QMU and containers, then it would be basically you just say uh, in YAML, I want to use this container and I want to use this uh, QMU configuration and that's it. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. Good yeah, so this is the work of Benjamin Tissoir. Uh, so Bentis, uh, if, if you're... Um, aware of FDO, then you probably know his name already. <laughs> He's awesome. one of the, yeah, amazing admins there. Thank you. You're welcome. Good question. You, okay, so Brendan, suggesting not a question. You mentioned test reporting format. We, other testing framework, are working on standardizing around the flavor of TAP called KTAP. Okay, well, thanks, uh, Brendan. That I'll definitely look into it. Oh, and Matthew already has some concern. <laughs> I mean, this was not a problem before because we could, I mean, the root FS basically was preventing getting there, but if we can just run any container, then indeed that's the last thing. And then all the idiosyncrasies of uh, how to run tests in different farms could probably just be abstracted away and be like, well, you put that in your container and you output this file and you put it in this place and that's your results. That would be lovely. So Kenny is saying, you've mentioned test containers a lot. Beside the one listed in your command line example, is there a list of public containers somewhere? Ooh. I don't, I'm not aware of, but um, that's definitely our goal. So I can talk about graphics. So IGT is one, and they, they are definitely the trailblazer, uh, trailblazers. It's been working very well. Um, then for Mesa, the, um, the graphic driver for Linux uh, in the user space, um, it's 
There's, there are a lot of containers already that are running, but then you see this uh, bare metal is using rootfx generation, usually based on uh, dbootstrap. Um, but then this is something that they potentially would be interested in replacing um, to in favor of, of boot to container, but that's um, well, a bit more in the future. So what I can say is that for valve testing, this is generally what we're going to be doing. Um, so there's going to be basically running games in containers. That's <laughs> a little crazier than than probably most kernel developers are going to be thinking about when they write their test suite, like F XFS tests, for instance. <laughs> and the output is a bit more complex than looking at the air node or something. It's frames and comparing frames and and all the the the, the fun with doing that. <laughs> Okay, so Kevin is asking, where are the codes, docs for boot to container? Uh, so I put this in a link, uh, but you would have to basically download um, uh, boot to container. It is there. Uh, off the top of my head, I think it's gitlab.freedesktop.org slash M-U-P-U-F slash um, boot to container. I'll post a link in the chat after the talk. You can also, anybody can download the PDF with the arrow uh, at the bottom left of the slides from the blue button. That too, but Kenny sent the link. Thanks, Kenny. We have uh, four minutes left. Thank you. But definitely have a look at the boot to container uh, readme. Um, it shows a bit more versatility than than just the example I gave this. Um, for instance, one thing that we are very happy with is um, this mirror condition. Here, there's only one, but you can have multiple ones that are that you can specify. And um, I, mean, I think the interface has been has been pretty nice. I generally agree with uh, Matthew on why reinvent a new specification if gunit.xml exists. I think gunit will need to be extended to support DMESC message, but otherwise, I mean, I don't see any reason why not using this. And there's even support for frame, and then so you can have screenshots of how things are looking, which works for me. So Kevin is asking, do you track a set of kernel k-config options that are required for a kernel that can run B2C? Yes, yes, it's painful, <laughs> but they are there in the readme. If you scroll down, you have anything that you need on top of the default x86 underscore 64 um, uh, default um, config. Hi, uh, I just had a quick question. Um, you noted that it can be very painful to have to uh, flash a uh, new kernel or root FS uh, onto some images. Uh, did you look at uh, KEXEC as a way of avoiding needing to flash a kernel? Uh, yeah, I mean, in a way, KEXEC is a bit like having a, a side loader, or oh, not side loading, but basically another bootloader. Um, so that could be a solution, but then I, I don't know. I just see it just like booting uh, using IPC, so I can choose basically what kernel I want to boot. And uh, but yeah, I guess it's possible to just boot a normal Linux, a normal user space, and then download the um, the, the kernel that you want to boot, and then boot on that. It's just that it's not needed nowadays because you root or or IPC or anything else can do it for us already. So this is what we're using. So one benefit of net booting everything is if a cache device becomes corrupted or something, then we can just have it automatically reformatted. So that's that's pretty practical. Uh, we don't have to reinstall a test machine just because there's been a 
corruption in memory. This is not a problem. The best part is no part, right? <laughs> Thank you, Martin. It's now uh, time for Nikolai and his talk about KCIDB. It's been a really good discussion. Thank you. Nikolai, are you are you ready? Almost. <laughs> okay. Ready. Okay. Well, hi everybody. I'm Nikolai Kondrashov. Uh, I don't have controls for the slides at this moment. I think. Sorry, I'll give you, I'll give you this right now. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Now I should it should work. Okay, so I'm Nikolai Kondrashov. I um, work at Red Hat uh, as a software engineer at the CKI project. I'm also a KCIDB developer and maintainer at Kernel CI project, and I maintain my Digimen project from time to time. And I do electronics and embed it as a hobby. So slides have links. Uh, if you download them, you can click them and see more uh, regarding that slide. And also each slide uh, can have this little blob at the bottom that means that this slide is talking about the next release of kcidb it's not not released yet but hopefully going to be released soon this autumn so a little intro so you you know that there's lots of uh, testing systems that test linux kernel and uh, each of them has their own dashboard and each of them has their own uh, mail report and uh, this, the, having all this takes time from test system maintainers and developers and also from kernel and developers and maintainers because you have to adjust to each of those and you have to review each of those and jump between them and they arrive at different times, etc. So uh, we just, a few of us just thought, well, we can try to unify that, have some unified protocol and uh, and the system and the database for collecting all those different results, aggregating them, and then uh, having a single dashboard and having a single kind of email that's going out when, when needed. Uh, so we call this system KCIDB. Uh, kernel CI uh, is, is still having their own, uh, our own uh, native tests running in, on, on the various labs across all the world. But there is also now a KCIDB database which takes uh, data from testing systems which want to use other software, not kernel CI software, and that would be uh, Linara Tux Suite and uh, Red Hat CTI and Gentoo Kernel CI ARM testing and Google Sysbot, who have been here before earlier. Uh, and of course, the native tests from kernel CI also send their results to KCIDB, and uh, they are all mixed together there. Uh, a little closely, uh, KCIDB structure is very simple. There is a message queue, CUDA, uh, I'm sorry, that's Russian, where, where submitters are sending their results in JSON. And that gets delivered to a database, which you can view in the dashboard. And there is also a monitoring system, which uh, uh, looks at what's coming in and what's already in the database and generates notifications with reports based on uh, any number of conditions. Uh, so right now we are getting about uh, 100,000 test, uh, separate test reports per day and 10, around 10,000 build reports. And uh, we're processing, receiving about 100 different uh, code revisions with, of the kernel. Uh, we have a dashboard, <clears throat> which you can check out on the link below on the slide. Uh, it has been um, relatively recently updated to have a little bit more features, but this is the dashboard for the um, for the current release. I will have to redo it for the next release a little bit. Uh, uh, we have a bunch of uh, command line tools which we use to maintain uh, the system, and also those can be used for sending data to the system and querying it from there. We have a Python three library which, if you want to integrate more closely and uh, submit the data from from uh, Python or query the data from Python. 
uh, we are sending proof of concept reports, which are getting a little bit too big, and so we are going to be replacing them uh, with a different format. Uh, will be shown later. We have also have uh, um, an implementation of a dashboard by CTI, my project at Red Hat, well, our project at Red Hat, uh, and uh, it's done using uh, extended KCIDB protocol using the um, facilities for extending the prot uh, protocol and the schema in KCIDB. And uh, apart from just the feature similar to the current dashboard, it also supports tracking and marking known issues and uh, uh, masking them out uh, if there is a bug reported and we know about this issue. So we don't fail our tests uh, unnecessarily. Uh, so I'll briefly go through the IO schema, the schema that is used to communicate with KCIDB uh, to give you a little sense of what data is already there and what's coming. So there's just three kinds of objects in the database. It's the checkout, a build, and a test. And uh, these are main fields for a checkout object. And they, the only required fields are on the left is the ID and the origin. And the rest you can add as, as, you, as you get the data available in your testing system. And uh, you can choose, pick and choose to make it easier to start. Uh, the build is, uh, has a similar number of fields, and it has one more required field, checkout ID. And the test results are also here. There, are, As you can see, there are not that many fields, and, uh, and even those you don't have to send. And this is a work in progress, of course. We are iterating on what we need, and this is a, already a fourth version of the schema. And the links to that schema are below. So I would like to make a poll if I can figure out how to do it. Hmm. OK, I'm not sure I can figure it out. Guillaume, can you give me a hint how to make a poll? Yeah, if you can, yeah, if you can first. First. No, you oh. have, should have yeah, thanks. So, oh my. Okay, this is too complicated for me right now. I don't, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on that. But basically, I uh, wanted to know if there are any. Uh, Test system maintainers here and the presentation. If you can just drop a word in the chat, uh, particularly those who we don't receive data from yet. And uh, if there are any actual kernel developers or maintainers here. Yes, Dmitry is here. Well, we receive data from you already, but we would like to receive more, of course. Oh, yes. Odor. Yes, cool. Cool. OK. Then I'll have to do the complete presentation. OK. Let's go. And yes. So the submission interface uh, is rather simple. If you use shell, you can just pipe your data, your objects one by one into a comment, which has just a few options and off you go so once you send the data it's there you don't have to go back there and like get ids for sending or anything it's just you can just throw the data there and be done with that as long as it complies with the schema uh that previous example just sent an empty report to the database and this one does the same use only using python 3. uh then here's an example of uh I think it's a complete module from uh, kernel CI backend, which talks to, to KCIDB and sends results there. It, it's just 265 lines. And here's the um, uh, gentle kernel CI, uh, well, support for KCIDB. It, it was taken a little while ago, so maybe now it's bigger, but at that time it was 193 lines. 
And here's the syscaller interface written in Go, and uh, because we don't have a library in Go, it talks directly to Google Cloud. And it's 186 lines. We have a how to, how to start submitting the data, and we have a separate playground with the dashboard and the database where you can experiment with sending your data without messing up anything or worrying about anything. So uh, we think that developers should be in control of the data they receive from our database. And uh, so we are implementing the system of subscriptions and notifications where you can pick and choose what you want, what conditions you want, and what data to send. Here is an example of a simple subscription, very basic using stock reports, which are coming next. Uh, so here is an example of a report we are working on right now. It's uh, basically saying, updating you about the status of a, of a revision checked out from this repo and at least who check, checked out the that, that revision. Then uh, it also displays all the build information. So there's uh, one build failed out of uh, 859 builds recorded. <clears throat> and that's ARM all no config build. And also list who sent the builds. And then there is a summary of the test results. 15 tests failed. We only list like five top failures. And uh, then there is a link where you can go and check out the all the details if you want. So uh, I would like to ask if there are anybody who are still not sending the data to us, uh, what would make you want to send your data? Okay, please uh, just speak up or write in the chat as you wish. Yeah. Uh, so uh, at the file systems mini conference, we were comparing notes. Uh, all of the major file system maintainers that were there, XFS, ButterFS, EXD4, uh, we all have our own infrastructure for running XFS tests. Uh, one of them was using KVM XFS tests, I think then he switched to his own. Um, but uh, we all generate uh, JUnit XML files that have all of our test results. And the one thing that we are all missing is essentially dashboard functionality of the form. You know, we're running tests daily, sometimes multiple times a day. Um, and right now we are eyeballing uh, summaries to discover uh, when a test has started failing. We have a bunch of tests for a number of different configurations that always fail because we just haven't gotten around to it. Um, I run ext4 with 12 different configurations uh, of you know the file system config. So it's XFS tests in you know, 12 different uh, combinations of file system mount options, uh, format options, et cetera. Um, and what we all badly need is a way of being able to be told, this is a new failure, right? As opposed to a known failure. We have a bunch of tests in some configs that always fail and we haven't gotten around to fixing it yet. Um, and if there are flaky tests, being able to report this test started to flake as of such and such a time, you know, and it's flaking 20% of the time or some such. Um, and, uh, you know, some, some kind of graphical dashboard that shows that would be super, super interesting. Uh, I've looked at the kernel CI dashboards and it doesn't look like any of the dashboards I've seen have that sort of functionality. A lot of them seem to assume that they prefer that you know the test be 100% green, and if there's a single test failure, it turns red, and you're supposed to scramble to fix that. Um, but we live in a world where, you know, like I said, I run 12 different uh, configs for ext4. XFS probably has a half dozen or more, and you know some tests just always fail. So uh, we need a way of saying, yeah, that's a known failure. So you know. Don't make that turn the dashboard uh, red. But when we see a new failure, that's what we really, really are interested in because we want to fix the regressions. Um, and that's sort of the requirements we're all looking for. And we're, we were actually saying, yeah, we need to find someone to help us build that because none of us are test engineers. 
uh, and, and we really, 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 really could use something like that. So I come bearing requirements. I don't know if that's inside the scope of what you're doing, um, but if it is, that would be wonderful. <laughs> yes, thank you, Theodore. Uh, something like that is uh, on our horizon. It's, uh, we are still not there, of course, but uh, there is there is some something done, for example, in CKI, CKI dashboard and uh, well, that's one of the things that I would like to copy some of, of that at least. And uh, I think that is, of course, valuable, especially in the number of, when the number of tests goes way up. And uh, I think that this is basically a, a requirement for a database like, like ours, which already receives like 100,000 test results a day. Uh, so thank you very much. That That's something I think we definitely should do. Yeah. Can I say something to you, Theodore? Uh, because what, what basically what you're asking, Theodore, is what I wrote uh, for Intel. It's called CI Pueblo. It's an open source project uh, that is indeed a database. And it tells you not indeed like you, it doesn't care if everything is green or not. What it cares about is regressions and changes. And every failure needs to be documented in a bug so you can then have um, you can see the occurrences uh, the occurrence rate of the bug which when it was seen in which configurations on which machines and the way you create these filters to say what the bug is catching is which test it came uh, or it was seen on uh, or it can be a, uh, not yet a regular expression on that but at some point yeah uh, which machines or machine tag, if you want to have like generally x86 uh, or ARM, for instance, that tags that you can put on machines. And then you have regular expression on STD out, STDR, and DMESC. And if the list of all of this is being uh, accept, uh, like uh, matched, then this is a known bug and this is filtered out. I'll send you a link to a presentation I gave about this and you can see if this is what you want. And I believe it is because <laughs> this sounded very much like what we needed at Intel for getting uh, IGT running on 100 plus machines and 3,000 tests and integration testing, testing all the way in graphics nuts. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. No, but, yeah, that sounds great. I mean, uh, we have order 500 to 1,000, depending on how many tests get skipped per file system config, multiply that by 12. In the ideal world, uh, each of these tests generate a huge tarball with test artifacts. It'd be great if when you clicked on a test failure on a particular test run, you could actually download the test artifact. But, you know, uh, you know that may be asking too much because now we're actually talking pretty serious amounts of storage. But, um, you know, part of it is, is that at work, we have proprietary systems that do all of this. So I know what is possible and it's just, I'd love to find a way to do that in the open. So, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to add uh, two comments about kernel CI. So the, the current front end on uh, linux.kernelci.org shows regressions. So it's already, you know, if something has always failed, it, it shows it, but not in the, in the same way as regression. So that's already one, one way to go to find issues. But it's not as advanced as what Martin has said. Um, the other thing is we are now um, gathering user stories or requirements or ideas about how people would want to work want to work with a system that reports uh, errors um, so any ideas like you know um, the one the things that that Ted has said uh, or maybe ideas from um, Martin's work uh, it would be really good if you could um, write this down in a shape uh, that we can reuse so that there's um, email thread about this there's a discussion on github I'll put some links on the chat. Uh, the idea is to create a new um, front end for kernel CI uh, to collect results from all the test systems and also have um, a web interface and maybe also emails and other ways to communicate with it, like command line tools, APIs, uh, to have all these kind of user experience based on, on all these different user stories that people have. Thanks. I think we have uh, six minutes left, so there's still a bit of time for questions, discussion. Yes, thanks, Martin, and uh, I will check out your presentation as well. And uh, one of the questions that is uh, difficult to 
well for us to answer is what to do if you have a failure in a single test that is known and another one that is unknown do you fail that test do you notice i guess you cannot notice if there is an unknown issue uh, no it, if something is unknown it's considered as a regression to begin with i mean like you you grab std like you search for patterns in, in the output right so you found uh, you got your results of the test you found the pattern in the output and you say okay that's a known issue but later it turns out that there was another issue as well discovered in that test yeah so there could be indeed if you start having multiple bugs you might not catch additional regressions um you can sometimes but if not always and yeah that's a limitation that and I mean, to be fair, there are ways of, uh, of potentially detecting something else, um, but it requires a bit more uh, thinking about the filtering and how you want to do this. Uh, this was, I mean, this has been sufficient for I-15, which I mean, it's a, the driver is insane, uh, but uh, there are ways to improve on it. It's just that from um, a, a user's perspective, a filter is already something that is a bit remote and people looking at the, the report might be being like, oh, well, I don't know, like, it, it seems a bit magical, even though it is so simple. It, it uh, Having talked to well, 100 plus engineers using this system, they have been like, I have no idea how it works. <laughs> Even though they have access to a website that where they could see the list of bugs, which platforms is affected, what is the reproduction rate. I mean, CM probably is it's not bad. I'm going to tap myself, pat myself in the back here. <laughs> I mean, it, it has been allowing testing the kernel, doing integration testing, which is something that is uh, tricky. But there are ways to improve on it. Uh, but generally, we found when there are like two bugs basically going on top of each other. And well, at some point, there's a limit to what you want to do. Um, documenting is great. Fixing is also helping. All right, thanks. So uh, I gathered that it's a, it's a you know, fundamental problem with uh, accidentally masking unknown issues. But uh, yeah, and the regular expressions are, of course, magic. There is no question about it. Well, they're magic, but this is something that you discuss in a bug. What should be the filter, like what should the filter look like? And every time someone changes the filter, it posts a comment directly on the bug. So it's it's not completely, you know, like out of the blue. I don't know how, how the association is, is done. And uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the filter is actually, it's a, a, a domain specific language that we created that, that basically is an SQL query. It's, it looks much better than an SQL query, but it is an SQL query in the end. <laughs> okay, thanks. I, I've, I'm afraid we, we are running out of time, so I'm going to ask one, one more question from uh, kernel developers and maintainers and uh, perhaps answer in the chat what would make you want to access that data and look at that data or receive those those uh, notifications from us or subscribe uh, rather subscribe to those notifications and uh, what would prevent you from you know having any use out of this what would stop you from using it so if you can just send a message in the chat okay otherwise uh i assume we're running out so if you want, you can, aha, uh -huh. okay, I lost control of the slides. Anyway, uh, uh, you can reach us at Kernel CI channel on LibreChat, and we have Kernel CI at Groups IO mail list, so you can find us there. Thank you. Thanks, Nikolai. Uh, maybe you can.
uh, uh, details on the chat. I think that's not the slide deck. It's actually the oh the, yes the, the thesis to it. <laughs> right, it's the file I got from the website. Yeah, there are two files in there. Um, <laughs> okay, one is the actual thesis. Uh, uh, yes, I'll give that's you that's good advertisement uh, for reading. <laughs> Uh, I'll give you um, I'll give you a uh, presenter right so you should be able to upload the file yourself if that's okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can't see it yet. Okay. Now you should have uh, oh, with the plus uh, button you should be able to do manage presentations and upload PDF. Okay, so I think you should be able to see the slides now instead yeah. of the um, actual thesis. Okay, so um, we'll um, get started here um, on some food for thought. Um, basically, uh, the actual thesis from Meta Pollard, um, and we were testing some kernel implementation against an verified oracle. Let's see if the slide control works. There we go. Yeah, yeah so let me just introduce myself. Um, as, as Luca said, my name is Mette Pollard and I'm an undergraduate at the Technical University of Munich and I'm specifically interested in the development of high assurance software stacks using formal verification. Yes, and my name is uh, Lukas Pulvan. I did my PhD in formal methods, working with the theorem prover Isabel. We'll talk about that later uh, during my PhD. Then switched to industry, and uh, since then I'm interested in Linux-based systems and in the safety argumentation around them. Um, you might have heard of the ELISA project. Other than that, I clean up stuff in random places in the kernel. And so what motivated us to this work um, that we'll show you is basically um, that you have a problem that you want to increase confidence and the correctness of some implementation. And you know that, of course, the higher the confidence you want to go get the higher the engineering effort. So on the lower left corner, you find unit testing, right? You write a few test cases and hope it just is good enough to find the bug. Um, on the top right, this is uh, the other extreme, you really verify the existing implementation. So you model all the details in C in a theorem prover, so a dedicated program for that. You then create a proof in that um, prover uh, for that implementation and you know that that program is correct without even testing it. Of course, that is highly complex um, doing a mathematical proof. Plus you have the complexity that any performance optimization you do, you have to uh, provide a proof of that. So we're looking at a uh, alternative where where we are kind of in between those two extremes and we want to test against a verified oracle. So we have a implementation that is without performance optimizations and we verify that and then we show equivalence by testing of the implementation in that we're really interested in against the one that we verify. And that gives you a middle ground in confidence um, of correctness and the engineering effort you're looking at. So what did we do specifically in our concrete example? So we used Isabel. Um, Isabel is a, a proof assistant, theorem prover um, for formal verification. So a human writes a 
proof and the machine checks that proof based on logical rules. Um, we have the fortunate situation that the Isabel developers already verified a red black tree implementation in Isabel. So we have a verified test, test oracle. And we have the convenient situation that kernel developers made a red black tree implementation in the kernel. That's the implementation under test. And we did the last step of that. We just test the equivalence of those two implementations extensively. And I think with that, and uh, Meet is going to tell you more about the details how we do that. Yeah, exactly. But I don't think that I can switch the slides. Um, so it would be nice to have presenter rights. Or you have to do that, Lucas. I can jump ahead and then Guillaume can give you the presenter. Okay. Um, yeah, so this slide is important. Um, it shows us the, the whole testing pipeline. And it's composed of six components. Um, at the top, you see um, the so-called test case generator. So um, as Lucas said, we want to test um, some test cases on the um, kernel red black trees on, and on the verified red black trees. So these are these two ones. And then we want to compare them. So, and for that, of course, we need uh, some test cases at first. Um, and the verified red black tree um, is generated by exporting it from Isabel. So that, that was the proof assistant that Lucas mentioned. And um, on the left side, we have like the kernel side. We somehow need to export or make available um, to user space uh, a red black tree instance, but that you, uh, which uses the um, basically the kernel implementation. And I did this by, by just using a kernel module that um, um, that exposes two files on the debug file system and. We will dive into that uh, shortly. And in the end, uh, we obviously have to compare the red black trees and see uh, do they both equal or are there differences? And if so, are these bugs or what is happening here? So let's start with, um, with the easiest component, um, the, the kernel part. Um, so what I did was uh, basically exposing two files on the um, debug file system. Um, the comment file is used for retrieving the current tree, so reading from it prints the tree, uh, writing to it uh, reset, so writing a zero resets the tree or just returns a new empty tree, writing a one inserts a, a new key that was uh, previously specified in the, in the other file, and writing a two deletes a specific key. And that's actually sufficient to test like the core part of the red black tree implementation. So insertion, deletion, and we have a kind of um, printing the whole tree. Um, of course, in the in the kernel implementation, there are some more functions, some auxiliary functions, but for all purpose, we concentrated really on the algorithm because this is also the one that was um, uh, formally verified in Isabel. So the interesting part, obviously, is um, how do we actually obtain uh, a proof for a data structure? So in our case, this, um, this data structure that was proved by the Isabel developers is in a functional programming language called Isabel Hall. And um, it's basically a purely functional programming language. If you, if you are into functional programming, then you might know what this means. And in the end, there's like a strong relation between um, between a function and the way how computer scientists understand them and how a, a mathematician understands them. So we can use the same methodologies as a mathematician would use. So I, I won't show you the, the proof because it's rather complex, but if you're really interested, um, there's an online link that you can follow and just read some of the proofs if you're really interested. Um, 
But just to give you some intuition, for example, how actually a data structure in a functional programming language looks like. So this is actually the whole code for the um, red black tree insert function um, without the type definition. So without what is actually uh, RBT. Um, so the one thing that you um, that I want to highlight here, the important thing is that in the end, um, even though if you're not really into functional programming, um, in the end, these equations that we see here are really just um, mathematical functions. So we can just use standard proof techniques that is we can use induction, we can use case distinction, we can use um, um, name it, we can use uh, um, a direct proof. Um, yeah, because everything on the left, uh, on the right, just depends on the left. So that's how a mathematician would understand this. And um, in the end, we can export this Isabel code, which was then verified later on, um, to a, a programming language like Haskell. So we can actually build our tooling around it. Um, so this is in the end what this verified executable RBT component is uh, telling us. Um, so in the end, we do have to compare these two trees after applying uh, a test case on them. And quite interestingly, um, after inserting the elements from one to three, um, the Linux red black tree produces a different tree than the verified one. So uh, the question, of course, now is, uh, did we find a bug? And uh, the answer is no, we didn't. Um, the problem is that um, there exists some ambiguity in, in the specification of red black trees. So they are both valid red black trees. And because of this ambiguity, there can exist more than one variant to implement these red black trees and um, in our um, in Isabel we know uh, we have verified two different variants and um, there exists uh, one more that was not verified for example left-leaning red black trees they're quite similar but not exactly the same um, but we didn't know this implementation the Linux kernel was using it's another variant um, so the question now is how do we deal with this kind of ambiguity and specification that is still valid and that still produces on the Linux side valid outputs and we basically have um, we have two uh, uh, two possibilities the first one is that we um, export and specification on um, um, an executable specification um, from Isabel and that then that we then check the Linux red black tree against this executable specification. But from a performance wise point of view, this is not really what we want. What we actually want is really just comparing these two, these two trees and see if they're really equal. Um, so another way is obviously um, proving that this uh, implementation that or the variant that the uh, that Linux is using is indeed correct, um, and at least for the insert function, uh, that's what I did. So I translated the C, the C variant or the C algorithm into the functional one, and based it on the original proof. And it, it took some time, but in the end, it worked out. And we can say that um, if we assume that my translation was correct, then um, also the Linux variant for insert, RBT insert is also correct. So the last part is um, obviously the test case generator. Um, I implemented three different strategies for, uh, for, for generating test cases. The first one is really a purely random um, test, uh, test case generator that just, that just suggests insert and deletes and um, applies them on the kernel and on the verified implementation. The exhaustive one is a bit more interesting. Um, we test all, um, all, val all values within uh, a small scope. So for example, we can say test all 
possibilities that make sense from um, from one to three, for example. And uh, the last one I also implemented was um, a symbolic strategy. Um, what I did was um, that I basically lifted up the kernel implementation of red black trees to a user space implementation. So I can easily use symbolic execution tools like CLI. And um, with that, I also had to give um, CLI some kind of limit. Um, otherwise, it will search for infinite, uh, infinitely many test cases. So if you're really interested why I had to do this, there's also a section in my thesis. Um, but yeah, in the end, we could also use uh, symbolic execution to generate test cases and then apply them on the verified uh, implementation and on the um, kernel one. So I have also collected the coverage information. So these are line coverage and uh, they are collected with uh, GCOF and uh, not KCOF. Um, the reason for this is that um, the red black trees are blacklisted in the kernel for KCOF. Um, because uh, we cannot be sure if we somehow hit a line in um, in a red black tree in the red black tree file if this is really correlated with, for example, the insert operation that I previously called using a write system call. Because in between this write system call and the um, the actually actual function that is um, executed in the module, some other red black tree operations could happen in the kernel. Um, I've divided this um, this table in, in into two coverage parts. So uh, the core part is really what I've uh, told or, or explained previously. It's the core part of the red black tree algorithm without these um, auxiliary functions like RB next, RB uh, first. Um, an interesting thing that you might notice is that uh, for the random um, strategy, we uh, tested far less operations than with the exhaustive one, but the exhaustive one was um, much faster than the random one. And the reason for this is that the random trees can get quite large in comparison um, to the exhaustive ones. So yeah, um, I think we can move on. Um, to questions and discussions. Would you like to introduce the uh, discussions, Lucas? Sure, so I think uh, what you've seen here is the first experiment uh, in combining testing and verification around the kernel data structure. And we hit the number of, I think, technical problems, but also uh, problems on how to uh, continue this work, I think, We'd be interested in some feedback. Um, so, as Mita pointed out, we have that, of course, the, the source code and everything on um, on GitHub. But can we actually make such test oracle setups accepted by the kernel community? Um, so, I think there are a number of questions: how we can actually get such uh, thing upstream. Uh, as well as some technical questions on, okay, how do you actually use KCOF when you only want to look at a sub part? And um, is there more interesting aspects in diving deeper into symbolic execution? Um, yeah, so we're happy to get feedback on those points. With that, I think, yeah. Yes. So to the audience, let us know. Okay, I guess there's nobody commenting. And I guess the question is really... Well, the Daniel um, asked a question in the chat. Um, 
Can you talk uh, some more about symbolic execution in the kernel context? So uh, basically I cheated on this part, right? Um, I did not uh, symbolically execute a kernel code, but um, I lifted it up into, I lifted the required kernel code into user space and tested it then um, in user space. And this was easy because um, a red black tree is really not dependent on many parts of the kernel. So I just throw out uh, the RCU part and um, like the memory barriers and then it just worked. Um, but there exists uh, one tool that um, claims um, to allow symbolic execution in kernel context. Um, it's called S2E. Um, it's uh, a research project uh, by I think um, EPFL, uh, but I didn't use it in my thesis. Um, uh, it was quite complex to use. So I just used, because I also needed coverage information. So I just used the lifted up version for that. But indeed, that's, for example, something one could investigate uh, even more uh, when we would like to have, uh, like what we said in the third point, a symbolic execution kernel pipeline in combination with oracles. You're welcome, Daniel. Hello, we have a few minutes left. I just have a question. Do you think this could be run as uh, as key unit or key self test? So I, I think if, you know, key self test would be more for like runtime on a real machine and key unit where well, it's running in user mode Linux, but it could be run in more um, hardware abstracted way. Do you think, think it could it, fit? In, yeah, in I think it can be works? run. It can be run in um, in both. Um, as well as in K-Unit as well as K-Self-Test. I think K-Self-Test is the more, um, I think K-Self-Test is the better choice here because we need to run the verified Oracle next to it. And that's needing some interaction with the Haskell compiled uh, program, right? Uh, so you need an Haskell interpreter that's running uh, side by side. And I think that's also one of the questions for getting it upstream. We would want to drop um, generated source code in the Haskell programming language into a kernel repository. Um, I mean, it's only in testing a subdirectory, so um, I don't think too many people are going to look at it. But of course, we're introducing a number of new um, yeah, tools that you would need to run such a, a test case. Again, it's, it's a much more complex setup than just a unit test. Yeah. And I, I think that's basically just the decision of the community. If, if, so if uh, Lucas, that, yeah. this is Shua, um, uh, KSL test. Um, we looked at the generated code aspect before in one of our uh, kernel summits, maintainer summits uh, a couple of years ago with re related to SysBot because SysBot also has several, SysCaller and SysBot have several generated cases. So what we have determined is we do not want generated code in the kernel tree and it has to be a separate GitHub. Is that a possibility for you to keep that separately and have uh, people um, when they are testing the combination, uh, pull that and use it? Th that would be possible, but I, I, I think the, so what we're doing at the moment is we're generating the, the test, the, right, the verified test program once. Um, and it's, generated from kind of a formal specification. That's a bit different than the Linux arts repository you're referring to. Right. Because you're, there you're generating them in huge amount of uh, uh, cases, right? Here we're talking about one generated program and it's going to be in, a, in Haskell programming language. So I don't think too many people want to just touch that anyway. If it breaks, then um, you need to understand uh, 
how the whole generation works, how the proof behind it works, because you can't just modify the generated program, then you basically don't know if you're if you're testing against the verified variant. Right? So there are a number of implications of that. But yeah. Right. So for all of these things, um, I guess they um, make a proposal and send patches in, right? That's when, that's how okay. do you get the best uh, input from everybody. I mean, we do have, we, we have generated headers, uh, but it's, um, and we have limited fashion, like Martin is pointing out firmware, but um, this is all, we'll have to kind of look at what it is and uh, what are the implications. So it is related to case health test, of course, and uh, case health test. I agree with you that case health test is the best choice, probably, in terms of hooking the interface, arbitrary uh, interface, into it. However, we have kind of have to look at uh, uh, look at the look at what it is that we are. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I think we'll probably do that, and then uh, we'll see uh, how much maintenance burden and 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 that really brings and how long we can actually uh, uh, support maintaining that. And if it turns out in a year that this is just a pain, then yeah, we kick it out again. And we right. think that's fine, but yeah, let's see. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. That's the uh, the end of the allocated, allocated time for this talk as we have a 15 minute break now. And uh, there's also Paul, uh, you can uh, answer when you're back from the break, so we have an idea if everybody is back. Um, okay, thank you very much. I'll see you all in 15 minutes. Now we're back um, with Dan talking about Smash. So I'll make a presenter and then it's over to you. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, uh, my name is Dan Carpenter. Thank you for coming. Um, I work for Oracle and I'm the author of Snatch, which is a static analysis tool. Um, I've got kind of three, two micro talks and then uh, a micro discussion, hopefully, um, in this presentation. Um, so the first I want to talk about is um, the new, um, the new, Param key API. So some of you have seen this slide before, and if you have, don't panic. In the past, I've given introductory or beginner talks. This is going to be an advanced talk for an advanced audience. So um, this is how we handle like a K-free in olden days. We'd set up a call for the K-free function, then we get the argument out of it, then we say that the argument was free. With the Param key API, um, what I've done is I've uh, extended how the data is stored in the database and um, these slides move slowly. Uh, I've extended it and proved it. And um, so now instead of asking for the k-free function, you ask for the argument itself. So you say the function is k-free, you want the zero param, and the key is a dollar sign. That's like a wild card because of course, the pointer is going to be called different things depending on the caller. Um, a more complicated one would be release resource. And where, here's the key is um, dollar sign start. And that would be um, difficult to handle in the old code. But now it's quite easy to handle. So the match free function would look like this. I don't, it takes a long time for it to switch. It's disconcerting. Um, the match free function is just a one line function. Um, I don't know if you can see it. It's not that interesting. It's just one line. Um, there you go. Uh, so, um, wow. Uh, the beauty of this um, is that you can use the same match free function for both the database information and the hard coded information. Um, I'm, I'm going without slides. It just looks like blank here. Um, 
I wonder. I can see it. It seems to be working for one. Yeah. It's working for you. I'll just go blind. I'll, I'll, I'll trust that it says the right things. Do you um, want us to switch so, the slides for uh, you and you just tell us when you switch? It looks like it's going faster in this view. Oh, okay. So um, what you end up doing is you have one alloc function. Like this is from um, my check unwind script, which is looking for leaks. So in that module, then you've got one alloc function and one free function. But at the top of the function, then you've got a giant table, which describes everything that's allocated, how it's allocated, and um, how it's free. So the IDA alloc range, um, what alloc is the return uh, value? So that parameter is minus one. And if it returns um, a zero to int max, that means it's success successful and it, um, it needs to be freed on error. That's the end. All right. I think I would, could somebody switch the slides for me? Actually, that would be better, maybe. I don't know if that would work. Yeah, sure. So right now you're on slide well, seven, it says, and, and Mark will talk more. Yeah, good, fantastic. All right, so um, the param key API just makes things a lot easier. And um, I end up, you know, of course, it's so useful to be able to describe parameters. Um, easy is, is transformative, yeah. So um, next I want to talk about, uh, let's switch slides. And then next I want to talk about um, uh, sleeping in atomic functions. So um, how this looks like in the kernel is um, when you have a spin lock, you're not allowed to allocate things with GFP kernel. But underneath, there's a counter, which is called the preempt count. And when the preempt count is non-zero, that means um, you're not allowed to sleep. So um, I try, let me switch slides. It still is very slow. I don't know if that, I don't know how to make it work. It was working for all the other talks. Um, slide nine. So slide nine. yeah, thanks. So um, I tried this, uh, failed attempts for years, and um, or incomplete attempts and failed attempts. And I had a slide here explaining the, the stuff I tried, um, but I had to cut it out uh, because I could talk. So um, this, you can't really understand how beautiful and this is until you've struggled with it for, for months and months. So at one point it was saying, of course, print K doesn't affect atomic at all or preempt at all, but it was saying, oh yeah, that decrements the preempt count 7,000 times. And so it was just garbage. Uh, because of version and because of bug, uh, I think in places which we draw a lot of logs. Um, but how you can fix that is with check preempt info. And of course this one's got another giant table I didn't really probably need that, but I, I had the functions already, and so I just copied and pasted them. Um, but the beauty of it is it doesn't track the current preempt count. It only tracks if you're meant the preempt count, which means you take a spin lock, then it sets the state to increment. If you decrement it again, it doesn't say back to decrement, it says to ignore. So if you increment it twice, again, that's an ignore. Um, and then it records that information in the, in the return states. So what we're recording is that this function on this return path increments preempt count once, exactly once. Um, so, and it's not like the whole function. So like spin try lock, if it succeeds, it doesn't modify preempt count, but if it fails, I mean, if it succeeds, it does modify it, but if it fails, it doesn't. Um, let's go to the next slide. So then you brought, um, can we go to the next, next slide? So then there's a check preempt, which does track 
all the, um, the current status. And it um, uses the information from check the info. It has like a callback, so every time you increment or decrement, it's recorded in check preempt. And it stores that information in the caller uh, database for caller information, how if this function is called with the spin lock help. Um, and it, re it reads that information about how the function is called. Um, it also exports get preempt count, so, so, if, uh, so we can use that later. And um, sometimes functions are called, you know, sometimes with preempt disabled and sometimes with an enabled. And so there's an atomic check, which um, if it's true, preempt is incremented. Um, next slide. So maybe I'll just take over the slides again if I could. Um, it's, it doesn't make any difference. So then um, the other part of this is the um, check sleep info. Um, check sleep info looks for uh, GFP kernel and it has a list of functions to sleep. Um, it's a little bit complicated more than I've written here. Because, um, is it? Maybe it's not, it's that simple. Let's say it's that simple. And it records in the uh, database if this function always sleeps. Um, <clears throat> then the, the tech sleeping in atomic, um, what that does, it's just one function and it hooks from sleep info. If, if there's a sleep and the callback's triggered and it looks at the preamp count is greater than zero and it prints a warning. It's just one function, it's very easy. Um, and then the, the other critical part of this, which makes it all usable, is um, the change to smdb.py. So if I have a warning as this example, um, then I can check how it's called with preempt. So this is exactly what the uh, smdb.py script outputs as unmodified. So it's a very clear tree. So you, you, I have a script to highlight it, everything, and then I just go look at, how, look at the call directly. And I can send that in their bug report. And um, that's it. Uh, and it, it unfortunately, um, right before the talk, I realized that I think the real time stuff has messed up the um, this, this module. Uh, it's a little bit of tweaking, but it's simple enough to solve. Um, and I really like the increment, decrement, ignore. Um, I'm tempted to rewrite my locking check to use that, and reference counting could be done. That. Um, the other thing is that there's a lot of good stuff in the database. I feel like um, the database is undervalued, but it's it's so useful. And I also like how much it's split up. The original code this is one file, um, but when it's four files, it's easy to, it's easy to debug, easy to handle. So that's it. Um, that's the end of that part. Uh, I don't know if you're applauding, but it's like a, it's honor system. Um, the, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is race conditions. And race conditions have been frustrating. Um, if you look at SysBot, and we're all looking at SysBot and SysCaller, then race conditions are, are a huge cause of, of bugs. Um, and it's hard to fix them uh, through static analysis. And if a static analysis can't fix it, it's hard for even humans to fix it. So if you look at Alexander Paul, send this uh, patch, it is slightly modified, but um, it reads from SKB, SK transfer, and then it locks the socket, and then it uses it, which it should be the other way around. And the lock slot, actually makes it worse because um, if it, if you just didn't lock it at all, the race condition would be unpredictable. But with this, you set up um, uh, contention, you free the SK transport, and then you release this lock sock and uh, you're using, it's a use after free. So the 
so that makes it um, easier to analyze as well from static analysis. Um, here's the it's free. Um, <clears throat> this transport destruct uh, freezes transport, but it actually doesn't free it directly. It puts it on another list, and then a, a K thread worker thread frees it. Um, so Smash doesn't flat next after free because you'd have to hit a race condition um, before that would be a use after free. So there's all kinds of race conditions, and some of them are never going to be triggered. Um, and it's hard to know what to do. So anyway, so I looked exactly, um, exactly Alexander's bug. And um, I got eight uh, places where we should have called uh, lock sock. Two of them were bugs, and six of them were false positives. And one false positive looks like this. Um, we check here. Uh, we're dereferencing this. We shouldn't be dereferencing this. But actually, we check it again inside um, the log. So that's fine. It's just a shortcut here. Um, but it's hard to it's hard to debug that. You know, you want to print the warning here from static analysis. I guess we could silence that, but it's difficult. It's all tricky. Um, Lucas and Julia, I think I don't know. They're both smart people. They probably uh, both told me this is that we could infer the locks, um, which locks are needed, instead of saying lock instead of just hard coding in that, that this needs to be locked by lock sock, we could infer it because it's the next line. And so once you um, infer that lock, then you get a lot more uh, warnings, you get like 600 warnings. And I haven't gone through them all. There's a lot of false positives. Inferring locks is not uh, 100%. And um, it's, um, it's very hard to analyze. And I was also looking at which ones were going to cause problems in real life. And that's tricky as well. Um, I'm not sure uh, people would welcome patches. Uh, it's tricky because I don't like to send patches uh, which could break the code. I like to know that, oh, this patch is going to, this code is going to crash, right? So and nobody wants to get 600 static ticker warnings and go through them. Even I don't want to do that. Um, Norbert, um, so Sarah, this fix, and what it is, is um, there's a missing lock sock. And I mentioned before that um, that would be, that would have been hard to exploit if there weren't any lock sock. But this code, what makes it available is this copy from socket. So. When you're copying from user, there's ways to delay that so they get a slight hang. And then um, you you win the race conditions. You, you organize the race conditions to work out that way you want. So what this code is doing, it says, if, if um, we've already bound the socket, then we can't change any settings. But um, because of the race condition, we, we we start to change the settings. We hang the, the process here. Then we connect. Um, and then we change the settings. And then, boom, crash. And I, I believe all these bugs were from syscaller. So um, we're all looking at syscaller and trying to figure out um, if the bugs can be prevented with static analysis or exploited or whatever. Um, and of course, both of these. Um, and uh, Alexander are fixing bugs, and they're very clever people. Um, so yeah, copy from user, you can you can make it hang there. So let's look for that bug again. And here's one which is exactly the same bug. You got port count. If it's open, you're not allowed to change the settings. Fortunately, in this case, you're only allowed to change the settings if you're already basically root. So. Um, so that's fine. It's not fine. Um, 
but it's hard to exploit. It's not an exploit. <clears throat> then um, that's the end. No, life lessons, of course. Um, uh, Norbert and Alexander might be able to go through the 600 warnings and figure out um, if some of them are real bugs and exploitable bugs, and they might have fun doing that. But no maintainers want to deal with that. So in some ways, static analysis is better, more useful in this case for attackers than for maintainers. And my other thing is that locking is just so complicated and there's always exceptions and we're like, oh yeah, in this case, you might be right, but you're not wrong. You're not right because we haven't exported that or whatever. Um, maybe annotations would help. Uh, what I, in Smatch, I basically don't use any annotations. There's one check which uses user annotations. I love user annotations. Um, the lock, locking annotations, I kind of hate them. They're kind of rubbish and unnecessary. Um, what I would want from annotations is uh, maybe something human readable and I could run a Perl script and get information and create my table from it. Um, and then the other idea that I had is that maybe somebody could inject a little delay into every lock or every unlock or every copy from user and run sys syscaller with that. That's, that was my ideas. So are there any questions? Is there anybody there? So the chat matrix is also not working for me. There's no question so far on, on, on the chat. There's five minutes left. I was hoping somebody would have some ideas on locking is so complicated and I wish people had ideas on how to formalize things um, so that we could analyze it in a, in a static checker way. There's a discussion about Rust a bit later, so that's not an answer. <laughs> I just wanted to say thanks for at least looking into oh. it and, just, and experimenting with it because that's uh, super complex, as you said. And you said just like writing assembly code, it's at some point you're going to have to write some, and the same with locks. But it's not. Unfortunately, we need to write locks more often than assembly code. Oh, thank you. Have you thought about an annotation on, on the data? Like if you touch this data, you must hold a lock that goes along with it. Um, I feel like in a struct, uh, it's, it, I, I kind of prefer like a multi-member um, way of annotating. So you like, you can, uh, so you could annotate um, like four members in a row instead of adding on like a, a thing on the end of each. Um, but that would be nice, yes. Um, I, I think that kind of thing might help human readers as well. I think it helps everyone. <laughs> yeah, the lo locks, when you, when you create a new spin lock, when you declare a spin lock, you, you have to add a, a comment, otherwise check patch will complain. But those comments are not very useful, I don't think. They're probably better than no and, uh, nothing, but it, I haven't, you know, I haven't ever found like that's super useful. <laughs> so you're, are you looking to key off of those comments to be able to uh, check for lock, lock semantics? Uh, I mean, of course I'd love to. Um, yeah, I'd love to be able to do that. Would it help if um, the comment said which fields in the struct it protects? 
yeah, if it were if it were something that was in a you know like kernel doc format or something like that, yeah, if you could parse that, absolutely. So the other thing is, I don't know, did I, I don't know if I printed my the actual warnings. Um, uh, yeah, there you go. Um, so um, I, I probably should only look at the um, this last thing. But like for lock sock, it's a much more complicated thing, and um, it is uh, sometimes renamed different depending on how it's called or something like that. So you run into that thing where you assign a lot, you assign a lock pointer to something else, and so it comes up that it's a different name, um, but it's the same lock. Um, yeah, that's. Uh, Problem generally in Smash it doesn't like when locks change names. Where you, you, yeah. I've been toying with um, outside of the um, static analysis. I've been toying with marking um, members or like data that needs to be locked in, in some way that uh, I could then trigger case and accesses on it to kind of stop and then check that the lock is taken. Um, when it's accessed, like even for it, um, I've been trying to think of a way to kind of annotate data that needs to be locked and which lock needs to be held when those are accessed. And I think it's a bit beneficial for both the static checkers as well as runtime stuff. Yes, absolutely. And of course, um, uh, the example that people are going to give you, the counter example, is that in probe functions or when the um, data is not exported, then there's no need to lock it. But um, I would just always lock. Probe functions aren't, um, they aren't uh, fast path. So, right. so the there. yeah, yeah. there's no contention. Right, and I would argue that it's fine just to annotate the exceptions. If you don't want it locked, just find a way to kind of explicitly annotate that I know it's not locked here on purpose. Sure. Uh, yeah, I think people would just lock it in the probe functions. Yeah. There's no contention. It's easier to lock it than to uh, than to annotate it. But and so that'd be good. Yeah, I'd love that. I'll try and get something just so we can start talking about it. I'll send like a nerve thing. Fantastic. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. And now it's time for uh, the next talk about uh, fuzzing device interfaces with protected virtual machines with uh, uh, Felicitas. Yeah. Are you ready? Uh, yes. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I'll so... make you present that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hello. So uh, my name is Felicitas Hetzel. I'm a PhD candidate at TU Berlin. And uh, my colleagues and me, we have been fuzzing the device interfaces of protected virtual machines. And um, the reason we started this project is that um, there are now a lot of um, technologies released, or at least proposed, namely AMD SEV and Intel PDX that aim to protect complete uh, commodity operating systems, including all the device drivers from a potentially malicious hypervisor. And I don't want to go into specifics of how this is achieved, just suffice it to say that with these technologies, the hypervisor, including all the virtual device implementations, is excluded from the trusted computing base. And there have been some efforts to um, create a secure virtual device interface. So for example, TDX has proposed an implementation for um, device whitelists so that only specific devices can be attached to a protected guest. And in addition, you have the SVIO TLB component that um, is used to, to bounce uh, memory in between um, protected guest memory and unprotected or unencrypted memory that the devices can access. So now uh, with these technologies, you have a trust boundary between the virtual hardware and the operating system. And this is sort of an issue because um, virtual devices or 
like hardware devices in general, uh, mainly used to be trusted under the Linux threat model. So there is um, insufficient sanitation on data that is received from devices. And also we found that oftentimes you will have um, secret or control data like kernel pointers that are shared or even under control of the device. And another thing that we noticed is that um, sometimes if uh, the driver fails to initialize part of its state due to values reported by the device, these failures will not be probably recognized and handled leading to the driver code later accessing these structures. Um, yeah, so uh, we've been fuzzing this interface and it's actually kind of tricky due to several reasons. So for one, you have a lot of um, embedded delays in the driver code. For example, a common pattern, pattern that you would find is that uh, the driver will write a value to an MMIO register and then sleep for like a few uh, microseconds to a second and then read back the response from the device. And obviously this is pretty detrimental for your fuzzing throughput. Um, another thing is you have to think about how you actually want to inject your test cases into the IO interface because uh, compared to, for example, the user space or S interface where you have system calls, it is um, at least parts of the IO interface are not as easily accessible, I would say. Uh, then there's IOQ scheduling. So I, I guess you're aware that most uh, driver device interaction is triggered by IOQs. But another thing that happens a lot is that a driver would um, enter a blocked state in waiting on a resource that has to be provided on an interrupt path. So ideally, you want to um, recognize when this is the case and um, schedule interrupts in a timely manner. Um, then there is uh, state accumulation. So you keep interacting with the driver you're analyzing and the kernel environment. And uh, at some point it might happen that you um, reach a state where you cannot productively uh, continue fuzzing. So then you will have to reset your environment and that um, costs time. Uh, we also had issues with a lot of shallow and non-exploitable, so non-interesting for us bugs. And specifically, there was a lot of bug error handling is what I called it here. So if um, the device returns an unexpected value, the kernel would just panic. And then again, you have to reset your kernel environment and this will again um, uh, cost your fuzzing time. And lastly, there's an issue with coverage stability. So coverage stability means that if you uh, execute the same test case twice, you ideally want to um, trigger the same code paths. But in Linux, you have like a lot of concurrent um, threads and depending on the order in which they are scheduled, different threads might consume different parts of your test case and uh, um, produce a different coverage signal. And um, your mutation algorithm is, um, well, it's really suboptimal sub for your mutation algorithms if that, if that happens. So now the reason um, these points are grouped into three sets is that we were somehow able to solve or address the first three state accumulation we managed to somehow alleviate, but um, it's still a little bit of a problem. And the last two points are things that we still have to, uh, to think about. Yeah. So um, we built um, a tool to analyze this interface. It's a, a targeted driver fuzzing tool that is based on the Linux kernel library, LKL and libfuzzer. And uh, LKL provides the drivers and the kernel environment and libfuzzer um, provides the mutation and test case scheduling. And uh, so this is an in-process user space fuzzer. And um, the whole framework consists of several components. Uh, for one, you have the target driver that you want to analyze. This is um, compiled from the LKL source code. 
uh, and load it as a shared library. So it's compiled as a shared library and loaded into your harness. Um, then we so far implemented three device steps, namely Word IO, PCI, and platform. Um, and each of these steps can be used to analyze arbitrary uh, device drivers of the corresponding type. Then you have um, configuration files. Um, these, uh, for one, specify the driver you want to analyze and also um, the specific device configuration, like for example, MMIO resources that are required by the driver and uh, device identifiers. For example, for PCI, you would have the product and vendor IDs in those configuration files. And then lastly, um, for libfuzzer in general, you always have to write um, a little harness that invokes interesting functions in like the library you want to pass. And similar here, we also use a harness to trigger interest, interesting functionality in the, in the analyzed driver. Uh, so for example, what the harness should do is to initialize and uninitialize the driver and to trigger interrupts. And further, um, you can uh, call arbitrary system calls to either like exercise interesting code paths in your driver or um, configure your driver, for example, you could set an MTU value for network device drivers. Um, we uh, solved IO interception in two ways for um, streaming DMA, MMIO and PIO. We just um, adapted uh, existing kernel interface functions to um, just uh, consume and return or inject uh, data from your current test case. And uh, unfortunately for coherent DMA, you don't really have any convenient interface function that you could adjust because um, ideally you want to uh, return new values on each access to a coherent DMA um, memory area. So what we did instead is we um, piggybacked on the uh, address sanitizer instrumentation. So I assume you are somewhat familiar with address sanitizer, but um, Basically, you have this shadow memory. And what we did is we um, marked the shadow memory that corresponds to coherent DMA allocations with a special value. And we adjusted the error handling code of ASIN to, um, instead of throwing an error to inject um, data from our test case into the coherent DMA access and then continue execution. Uh, to uh, address the delay issue, we just uh, removed delays in driver code. So we have a compiler flag that is set when compiling the target drivers. And what this does is it um, replaces the functions that are commonly used to implement those delays with uh, our own version of those functions. And our versions basically just either reduce the delay to a very small value or return immediately. Um, for IOQ scheduling, uh, we um, track whenever um, an item is added to the, one of the Linux wait queues. Uh, and if this happens, there is a thread running in the harness that is notified and triggers an interrupt immediately. And to alleviate the state accumulation, we just load and unload the driver in each fuzzing iteration, obviously this would just reset the state in your driver. So there might still be state accumulating in the rest of the kernel environment, which might theoretically lead to problems that we didn't encounter any so far. Um, so with this tool, we get around 570 executions per second on average. Obviously this really depends for one, like on the hardware you're using, but mainly also on the driver you're analyzing and the complexity of your harness. Um, the paper, yeah, I wanted to provide you a link to the paper. Unfortunately, it's still pending in the archive submission process, but I will probably add it to the source code repository that's also linked here as soon as this is through. Um, yeah. So this was the current state. Uh, we've been thinking about uh, how to continue from here. So 
uh, one thing that we've been discussing is uh, to actually move this whole setup into a proper ProM setup. So all the adaptions to the Linux kernel library that I just mentioned should be pretty easily transferable to like a normal kernel. The only thing I guess you would have to work on is to uh, enable KCOF to actually trace coverage for all the kernel threads that consume device device data because I think currently it's only able to like trace coverage for system call paths and some uh, USB workloads. But a main advantage of having this in a VM would be that you can uh, reuse all the existing um, virtual device implementations that come with QEMU. And what would that, that would allow you to um, like either um, just modulate valid uh, communication or even instead of fuzzing like all interactions between the device and, to, and the driver to just um, pick a sim single, uh, for example, DMA buffer and just pass that. And I guess that would probably improve coverage or like allow you to reach uh, deeper code paths within your driver. Um, yeah, uh, AKL unfortunately does not support SMP or preemption. So what you cannot do is just trigger and interrupt at arbitrary times. So um, obviously this greatly limits the capabilities of our framework to find race conditions. And lastly, the way LKL is implemented is that you have your own LKL architecture under Arch slash LKL. So any code under Arch slash x86 is uh, not part of our framework and cannot be analyzed. Though I'm not sure if there's anything interesting there to analyze because the BIOS is actually also measured. So there is no trust boundary between the BIOS and the operating system. But yeah, I would have to look into that. Um, there are also some advantages to keeping this in user space. So for one, you have all the nice lip fuzzer features. We've already been experimenting with data flow tracing, uh, but like in general, there are um, more tools for program analysis available in user space. So for example, it would be interesting to do some experiments with symbolic execution. And lastly, I guess um, the overhead is a bit less, meaning uh, as well like um, the, the setup overhead and the usability, but also um, the runtime overhead. And uh, besides the interfaces that I've just mentioned, there are other interesting interfaces that um, would be worth looking at. So for one, there is the interface between the hypervisor and the bias. Um, there's the QEMU firmware configuration interface, and there are also like uh, special emulated instruction, for example, CPU ID. Uh, I've also been working on um, an interface layer to reuse uh, QEMU virtual device code in LKL. Um, I only have like a little anecdotal data, so I've already ported the XHCI host controller device. Uh, from Kuimu to LKL, and you can actually copy most of the code. You just have to replace um, the Kuimu interface functions with the corresponding LKL interface functions. But I guess this could be abstracted away in an in interface layer. And lastly, we've also written a static analysis tool for this interface. It was based on Smatch. Um, so what we did is uh, in Smatch, there's actually already a checker that traces user space data through the kernel. So we based our checker on that and replaced the functions that identify user space data with the functions that um, either return device data or map or allocate DMA memory areas. And then we just check what happens with this data. So you would get reports if such data is used in pointer arithmetic or if any kernel pointers are placed in uh, DMA memory areas. And uh, well, unfortunately for us, but fortunately for this community, I guess um, we had to stop working on this because uh, another group actually published a really nice paper that uh, does something very similar to what I just explained. But um, 
they go beyond. So they actually add, add I think, lightweight symbolic execution on top to um, uh, reduce false positives and also make the analysis more sound. So I would also encourage you to um, look into this if you're interested. The link is provided at the bottom of the slide. And um, that basically concludes my talk. But I have like a lot of backup slides. So if you're interested in the parts of the framework or the bugs, just I'm prepared to answer those questions, I think. Okay, thank you. There's a question in the chat if you want yes. to maybe start. Um, is it 170 executions on a single thread test process or per machine with multiple test processes? No, this is, uh, it's one core. Does that answer the question? Okay, yeah. How do you measure coverage, which are like how much of this, like for the drivers which you're analyzing, like how much of a code pass which interact with this different, uh, you know, take an input for this different interfaces have been actually reached? Uh, yes, yeah, so we use the um, standard Clang compiler options that are recommended for libfuzzer and um, we use this coverage. Yeah, the reported code coverage by Klein. And we only instrument the drivers that we are analyzing. So what kind of coverage have you been able to reach for these drivers? Um, I mean, roughly. Yeah, actually, let me look it up. Um, I think it was between like five and 25% of code. But this, this is 20, between five and 25, this is a generic coverage for all the code paths, right? It's not the, like, you know, bounded to the actual paths which are gonna take this MMIO input or something, or did I misunderstand you? Yeah, this is for um, all the code paths that have been traversed in the driver. Obviously, there will be some parts of the code that are traversed due to um, system calls issued in the harness, and some parts that will be um, due to traversed due to um, interaction with the device interface. Okay, so you, you don't filter like. Uh... So you don't try to get to the coverage because I'm, I'm I'm trying to explain what because we are doing very similar. And what we're trying to kind of, because there are many ways how you can fast all of this, and we're trying to kind of um, basically assemble the coverage of, of all the paths that you know, let's say there are like, you know, a thousand paths that you lead to different MMIO rights for, you know, our analyzed surface. And we're trying to collect uh, the data how much our fuzzers can reach these particular paths. So we're not just generally interested, like, you know, how much a fuzzer can trigger different paths in this particular driver, but we're only interested, can it actually reach that, you know, number of 100 or so which are present and which we know will take a different, you know, MMIO input or portio input? I'm not sure. I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. So could you maybe rephrase it? So, so what I'm trying to say is that, um, so maybe I'm not using the right terms. I'm not myself a fuzzing person. So, but we, uh, when you, when we, when we analyze this, we, we, as I said, we're doing very similar uh, project basically. So at Intel, so we are looking also at let's say port IO and if we focus on port IO and MMIO. So and we know that in the kernel, uh, even if we drop, we don't have to look at most of the drivers. You kind of you already mentioned it. The white list. Um, only a small set, but if you take this whole set of a kernel plus with drivers, we have a static analytic pattern actually much as well, but it's worked differently. It, it produces us a list of all the places where MMIO happens, let's say, and Portio uh -huh. happens. 
And we want to make sure that our father reaches all of these places and particularly mm -hmm. certain ones because we even flag them as being most likely to have problems because we look at this also Mondo manual audit. So this is what, for us, this is the meaning of coverage. So we want to make sure that our fathers uh, that we use actually a different type of fuzzing, but but they actually reach these places because otherwise it's it's very kind of hard to say. Well, yeah, we have 25% of code coverage, but have we actually how much of these useful places for us we've reached? Yeah, it's actually a really good good point. I should probably have evaluated that. Unfortunately, I just have what um, Libfuzzer gives me as code coverage for now. Um, and maybe one hour, an hour question, because again, as I said, it's very similar issues we are looking into. We have had one problem with the stimulus. So because our father is also kind of injection points quite uh, passive. So we need to find a good stimulus to execute this code. And uh, maybe not so much in drivers, but also in the core code. So have you researched like what can be a good stimulus for this kind of uh, low level code? I mean, you mean how to, um make the driver actually access um, the device interfaces? Yeah, so perform this MMIO, port IO, and, and so on. So of course, the initialization step is very useful because there is you know, PCI config space and all these things can happen. But then uh, in a runtime, uh, I mean, it, it's actually, we have found this being pretty difficult. So to actually, uh, to put a good coverage uh, in terms of what I explained, but try and find a good stimulus. So maybe it's obvious for some drivers, but it, it doesn't seem to be obvious for all the code we're seeing. And, and also mo most most uh, things have more the uh, initialization. That's not a problem here. I, I'm sorry, yeah, I didn't. Uh, drive all the time, yeah. Andrew, you're feeling very far from microphone. Okay. You're so, is that most most um, most things, at least in the core, have more only at initialization. So you have to reboot or reinitialize all the time. And I think the same is true for drivers that a lot of stuff, um, like for example, in Vertio, it has this complication negotiation step, but it only happens once at the beginning. So you would need to re execute the beginning all the time. To yes, I mean, that's kind of what we do. We initialize the driver in each fuzzing iteration. Okay. Yeah, oh, okay. Um, yeah, there are a few more questions in the chat. Let me see. Hmm. How much of this is specific to Fuzzing or is it applicable to any drivers? Um, I mean, if you, so a, a thing that's maybe not as applicable to virtual machines is like Fuzzing USB drivers, which we started looking into. Um, and all of these optimizations should also apply to the USB target. I think for passing um, from the user space side, I guess, I don't know how much sense our using our framework work would make in comparison to just using Syscaller, especially since Syscaller has um, a few nice features like triaging coverage and stuff like that, that we don't have. Um, this another, uh, what are the high and low bugs on this slide? Oh yeah, so um, I briefly mentioned this. So a lot of the bugs we found are actually not exploitable. So for example, invalid access or just readable assertions. So the high bugs are the bugs that have a chance of being exploitable. And the low bugs, um, in our estimate at least, are not exploitable. Um, yes, um, a question about this slide is, um, difference between via D and ND. So this actually evaluates the improvement by removing delays, as I uh, mentioned before. So via D is, um, fuzzing drivers with delays and ND is fuzzing drivers without delays. Uh, number of blocks is the block coverage reported by the person. And TTB on, I'm sorry, maybe I should have included this in the talk. This is just an overview of how much time it took the fuzzer to find the first uh, bug in each of the drivers. Yeah. Did I miss anything? <laughs> okay. 
uh, yeah, I, I would actually be interested in um, the Intus approach to this. Is there any um, anything published yet to look at? So there is a talk. Uh, it doesn't go into deep into the fuzzing. It does show on high level all the fuzzing setups we have so far. There's a talk on Linux Security Summit next week on uh, hardening with Linux. Oh, I don't know, I'm trying to remember how it was titled. Uh, but uh, yeah, but I think we can also talk directly. So uh, using basically different fuzzles, KFX, KFL, and uh, we have different setup based on that. So. Uh, okay, yeah. And actually we're having a smash button, but it works a bit differently. So it looks like there's a lot of similarity here. Yeah, <laughs> looks like it. We have uh, two minutes left in case someone else has any more questions. Yeah, hi. So um, I wonder if, uh, how difficult it would be to, to port uh, the fuzzer over to be able to run against a Linux kernel image. It could be a special Linux kernel image enabled by which just uh, takes some, or which needs to have some co some config enabled, which is just for debugging or something. But would that be feasible? So um, you mean instead of using LKL, using a normal normal Linux kernel source code? Right. Yes. I think it so would just... be. I, I, I think I briefly talked about this. So I guess. Um, Except for KCOF, it, it should be very easy to transfer the changes to like a normal source, normal kernel source. Okay, yeah, that would be great because then we could run it um, continuously, right, on, on, on newer kernel versions and that simplifies yeah, I mean, in integrating things yeah. into a CI and... Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah, so this is basically was one of the requirements we had. So we wanted something which doesn't require like much of a manual instrumentation. I mean, because it's it's with this fine tuning and stuff, it's great to find bugs faster, but it doesn't scale well for her kernel. Like if you think of non-driver code, like architectural code and so on. So they wanted to set up which would be like independent of, of all of it. So you can just, like you said, you take a kernel and you can kind of, you know, you put a couple of patches on top of a guest kernel and on top of a patches in the host kernel uh, and like install a fuzzing framework and you can just keep switching your guest and, and, and basically continue as fast. So they, they have been trying to work on that direction, so. Yeah. Um, there's one more question, do I have time or? Uh, Let's skip it. Sorry, Neil, this is time to, to uh, carry on with the next uh, topic, but I guess you could continue discussing maybe on the chat or in a, in a hacking room. Okay. Uh, because you know we're really tight with the schedule, so if we start diverging, we'll have some issues. But thank you for your talk; that was really interesting. Uh, next, we have uh, Miguel uh, talking about testing in kernel REST code. Yeah, I've made you a presenter. Is that working for yeah. you? Okay. I was working with the camera because I switched rooms. Okay. And uh, I have to enable it. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, let's start. So, yeah, this is uh, one more uh, rest in the in the conference, thank you for having us. Uh, even if we are uh, like a bit spamming <laughs> LPC with Rust talks, uh, but since uh, well, Arena new language is a bit of a, or touches a bit on many many subjects, I think uh, one one interesting subject was uh, testing how how we are going to do uh, testing uh, for Rust code. Um, so first of all, what I want to do is. Uh, give you a, a quick uh, overview for those of you that uh, perhaps don't know or uh, have not used Rust uh, so far. In fact, actually, we can, we can make a call. We 
Paul, keep your mind. Um, uh, sorry, uh, two folds, two folds. I don't know if you can see the poll. Uh, no, it doesn't, doesn't seem to yeah, I think it's today. visible. The presenter ah, okay. doesn't see the poll, only sees the results, but everybody else can see the true and false thing in principle. Um, well, I don't see any response, so okay. Uh, it's not working. I just responded. Okay. Um, the other day it was fine. Okay, never mind. Okay, it was, uh, I just wanted to see uh, how many of you uh, had some experience with this. Anyhow, um, so sorry, I cannot publish because it went away as well. So I don't know what happened there. Anyhow, um, so this uh, to give you an example, let's talk first about the user space quickly, uh, how it works testing in Rust uh, in user space, so normal Rust code, basically. So imagine that we have three functions, right? Uh, this function uh, returns x plus one, but has a bug, as you see here. Uh, this one panics uh, when the number is uh, negative. Uh, and this one uh, uses a result, which uh, if you don't know about, is a sum type, uh, which basically tells you uh, whether something is uh, contains either an okay value or an error value, so either successful or failure. Um, in this case, in the okay case, in the correct case, uh, contains an integer, and in the other case, nothing, so empty. So he only has the knowledge of an integer and whether it's uh, successful or not. So we are going to use these three functions to show you how, how the code looks like. So for tests, the rest, uh, we will write this in user space. Uh, I will describe a bit uh, how it works. Basically, this is a module. Uh, it's, it's not needed, but uh, this is, is idiomatic in, in Rust code to write uh, a module for the tests if they are unit tests, not iteration tests. That just uh, doesn't matter the distinction right now. Um, then use uh, super. Uh, basically, this imports everything that is, uh, for example, in the top of the of the file because this can be in the same file. So the previous slide where the functions were, imagine that it's a library or it's some code and you want to test that, that very thing, you can put it in the same file and um, then they will import uh, this into this uh, namespace so that we don't have to repeat uh, here or we don't have to put um, a namespace here. And then you list uh, some functions that you annotate this in an attribute and we annotate them as test. And this means that uh, automatically uh, they will be picked up by the testing system and it will be executed one by one. And then there is some macros and some facilities to for the usual stuff uh, in, a library, in, a, in a testing uh, library, as you know, uh, assertion for different uh, things. This, uh, as we will see, is two parameters. So that's, as you know, it shows in the output uh, the two parameters, the evaluation of, of both of them. So you can see the comparison, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then we have here also um, this, which is conditional completion in Rust, and this uh, is used uh, so that this code is not compiled uh, when the when you are uh, using the test mode, basically to compile the tests. So if you are in a normal build, you skip completely the, the entire module. So this is basically how it's uh, usually written, but it's not required to do like this. Uh, so anyhow, this is how uh, tests, normal test, one does this, one does space looks like. And quickly, uh, well, this uh, there is um, we can write it in the same file or we can also put it in another file. Uh, if it is in another file, in normal, car in normal cargo projects, user space projects, uh, what they do is have a test uh, folder where they put the tests, and those are supposed to be the integration tests, so they don't have access to the private function, for example, of a, of a particular file, if you want to call it like that. Uh, and the other ones, the ones that you write in the same file, would have access to the, to the, to the private functions. There is some discipline, some people say it's private functions should be tested, others uh, say they shouldn't, but anyhow, both things are, are supported. Uh, then we have also support for Rust support, as you know, so code, uh, Rust code can panic, which means basically an abort uh, for the kernel list, it's basically an abort. Uh, in the kernel, it will be like a kernel panic or a similar facility. Um, and uh, it, we can panic uh, in a test, which means it fails, but we can also say, or again, with an attribute, we can say this test should panic. So it's very support to, to test things that should panic as well, uh, like the death tests, if you want, in other libraries. Then we also have uh, the ability to ignore some code, some, some tests. And ignoring is useful because sometimes you have code that you don't want to test all the time, but sometimes you do. And then in, in the cargo command line, you can enable uh, 
things that you have to know. So you can have like a default set of tests to run, so to say. Uh, we also have uh, tests uh, based on results that can return results. So instead of uh, using the normal way of uh, like with the asserts or panics to know whether it failed or not, uh, we can also use uh, return uh, whether uh, the test failed or not just with result. That means useful in order to be able to use this um, easily to use this uh, question mark operator. If you don't know Rust, basically the question mark operator allows you. It's like an if where you if there is an early error, if it fails, then you bail out. Uh, propagating or bubbling up the the, the error, the error of, uh, to the to the caller. Uh, so instead of having to write a diff all the time, uh, if the type match, etc., etc., but the details don't matter. Basically, it is like an if, and then uh, you can change this call. For example, you may call the function you remember that we have that could fail, and return a return, uh, sort of return a result. Here uh, with the question mark operator, this x will be the integer. So it's already, if we arrive here to the X, if the X is assigned, then we already have, we already know it is, 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 is correct. And then we can call that again or any other function. So you can change the calls that may fail uh, easily to make a test. Then we have also benchmarks, but this is, um, this is an unstable feature and it's not too, I guess it's not too important in the beginning for, for the kernel. Uh, so if you run in user space, you see this, this kind of output. As you see, you see nice colors, uh, whether something was correct or failed, whether something was ignored. And there's a lot of options, some options that, uh, to tweak, to filter uh, tests, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The usual thing uh, in such a way. The good thing is that this is integrated into the library and basically every, every project uses this. Uh, and I'm explaining this because the question will be later, do we want this in the kernel somehow? And we will see. And then there is another feature that this is, I think, very, very important. And we, uh, we actually use it, we use it, uh, the standard library uses it as well. Um, and in the kernel, we even uh, caught a, a bug already or a mistake, let's say, uh, with this feature already. So there is, um, you can write, for example, uh, for example, examples in the, in the documentation. And these, uh, if you know Markdown, this is a code block. And this example, will be also tested. So when you run the cargo test that we saw, uh, if it is user space, it will run this test. So it will actually check that this um, compiles and runs and does not bug. Uh, and if there is an assert, etc., it also checks that the values are the same, etc. Uh, there is also support in the, in the code documentation. There's also support for ignoring. There's also support for uh, tests that only need to compile. So uh, they don't need to run. You just need to check that the syntax is correct. You can also check that the syntax is incorrect. I don't think that's very useful for us uh, in the kernel, but that's fine. So for some examples, it may be useful to, to be able to tell the user, don't do this, for example. Um, and there's also, again, uh, for functions that may panic, uh, you have support for, uh, there's support for the, the same kind of attribute as we saw for the other tests. So for the documentation tests, we have the should panic um, attribute for the test, which means uh, it will test that this panic, the same thing as usual. Um, so basically, uh, more or less, the features are more or less the same for all the, all the, all the kinds of tests. Uh, and this thing that you see here, that they put it uh, in order to also show you uh, that, uh, as we will see some screenshots later, this functionality is used for, for hiding this in the, in the generated documentation that we will see. So this will not be shown. If you run the tests with this uh, test added, you will see also this in the command line. Again, this is all user space. Uh, so you will see this. You will see, for example, that, uh, I, that you see both uh, in the assert uh, quality, you see both values, et cetera, et cetera, which is how the thing. Uh, the benchmark also look like this, but again, this is an unstable feature. Uh, we could use in the kernel perhaps with some tweaks, but anyhow, I don't want to like extend myself there too much. So how they do uh, quickly, how they look like in the documentation. So in the documentation, uh, this is, for example, how it looks, uh, the create I created for this example. Uh, we have the three functions here with the first line of the documentation here. And for example, for the one that uh, may panic, we see here uh, the documentation, we see the examples. And you see, you remember the, the thing that we have, uh, that we were hiding in the, in the code. We don't see it here. So the, the, the documentation looks like this and doesn't need to, to have some details. Uh, we use this already in the kernel uh, for some purposes, so, so it's useful. Also here, um, as we will see, 
In the left side, this is the other one with a bug, and we had four for examples. This was one that needs to compile. This was one that was ignored. This was one that uh, is not run, so it just compiles, and this is one that doesn't compile. Uh, and as you see, uh, I mentioned this here, not because perhaps very useful for testing, but uh, it's, it's just an example that the documentation generator, if we use this kind of documentation, is aware of, uh, for example, the tests and the text syntax, etc. So as you see here, they use it to mark this automatically. There is also a, uh, in Rust Analyzer, which is uh, it's a tool to, well, there is, it's an LSP server, so a language, uh, uh, language, sorry, I forgot the, 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 the S, uh, language server protocol uh, to, and we move to the chat, sorry, sorry to the chat in case there are questions. So Rust Analyzer is, uh, is uh, on one side, it's an LSP, LSP server for, for many, uh, for example, Veeam, Emacs, et cetera, et cetera, for many editors, but also for, for Visual Studio Code. And in Visual Studio Code, they have some extra features. Uh, and for example, if we put the, if we, I show you how it looks like in, in, the, in Visual Studio Code, in this case, uh, you see here, uh, for example, this button, there is a button that you can click to run tests, etc. This is very nice for users, of course. If you are developing, it's very nice to just click and run on these tests, etc. Et you see also here that there is a syntax highlighting. Um, so you see here that there is syntax highlighting for, as I, as I was showing you before, uh, in the editor. So the editors uh, already recognize these things so that you can read the code uh, without seeing uh, the green or whatever color you have in your editor. Uh, the other test would look like this, the normal unit test and integration tests would look like this and uh, also the editor allows you to run tests and debug, etc. Et so these all are all features of user screens, right? Uh, of course, it would be nice if we could have these buttons work uh, in the kernel, we will see. But the point is in the kernel and focusing now in the kernel, we have this is code that we have right now in the kernel, we have a function that trims by the space, trivial one, uh, gets a uh, takes a slice basically and returns a slice. Um, and uh, we test it like this. Uh, we tested uh, uh, something like this. Uh, and this, we have this function, it's the easiest one uh, that we test basically uh, in the kernel right now. And I think it's, uh, it's quite nice to have this right near the, basically very near to the actual function that you, are, you, you wrote. Um, and then for, for the other kinds of tests, we have, for example, here, uh, as you see um, in, the, in, the, um, sorry, in, the, in the in the kernel code, we have uh, in the kernel grade, we have some tests here. Uh, this test uh, will give you the, basically right now, um, we only test in the host. Uh, we do a hack to be able to run this code, uh, the ones that we can, some of the ones that we can in, in, the, in the host. So right now, the support that we have for testing the kernel is only in the host. But uh, I, I will in the next slides I will I will show you what we can we can do perhaps about it. Uh, and as you see here again uh, for this example uh, we we hide this uh, we use a feature and we hide this uh, function test wrapper because right now since we only can run this in the host of course we cannot run some code uh, here. So basically we use this as a way to only uh, have uh, like a compilation for this test. Also. Uh, I wanted to mention also that uh, these documentation tests, even if it's only compilation, so checking for types, et cetera, it only compiles the thing, it already caught uh, a mistake. So it's actually having the example, it's not just nice for, for user consumers of the documentation, it's also nice uh, to have uh, examples, et cetera, et cetera, so it doesn't get out of sync. Uh, so I think all these features, basically, and this is the end of all the features and how we use them, all these features already, I think they are useful and, and it's something that is uh, quite nice. Uh, to use. Uh, this also is another example, as you see here. <clears throat> uh, there is no code being run here. There is no code being run because this uh, implementation of uh, abstract, so this is not code that will be run in the test. Uh, so ideas for the kernel, wh wh what we want to do to expand on this. And this goes with, uh, this basically is a discussion with, um, going into a discussion on key unit and, and self-test in the kernel. So, one question is, of course, do we want to use key unit or how would we use key unit and self-test with Rust code? We could write perhaps a module or something in C and then call the, the Rust side of the kernel, etc. But I think it would be perhaps uh, nice or it would be uh, uh, easier or, or more uh, since the language already supports this. Uh, 
and the tools support this. Uh, even if we don't use cargo, we don't use that cargo test, we don't use cargo, but still we can run the tests. Uh, we, we can basically, we trigger the commands that cargo does in order to run these tests. So we support uh, the test of So We pick the test and we, we can already identify the test and run them or compile them. So the idea would be perhaps to, if we want to do it in Rust again, to have uh, another attribute or something that allows us to, te to tell quickly. Uh, here, I don't know if you can read it uh, for me. It's, uh, I saw also in other presentations that some of the letters were uh, strange, but it's, uh, it's host, basically, right? So we could mark some tests to be run in the host, like the dream white space. The dream white space, fun white space storing function that we saw, that can be run anywhere. It doesn't even need to have a kernel running or anything like that. It could be similar to user mode Linux, even, even not even that. We can just compile it as a as Rust code, pure Rust code. Uh, user space. So this could be one type of, of uh, test that would run very quickly or very easily. But we could also have user and kernel space uh, tests. This would be in the target, so cross compilation, etc., etc., would apply, and we would need to have somehow a way, for example, to uh, either. So either we, for example, do like a key unit or, or key unit or self test where we run them at root or something like that. Uh, or we have a way to trigger them after a kernel is booted, for example, in QMO or, or in, in an actual kernel running um, in a physical host. But we could perhaps also have a way automatically to spawn uh, QMO, et cetera, et cetera, and run this. I don't know. There are several ways we could do this. We could perhaps reuse some part of QUnit or all self tests and map basically this, use the compiler or those compiler to map this into a, or generate. A, a key, automatically a key unit uh, file or a self test file, and then uh, you reuse the framework there. But there are several ways to do this. Um, basically, my question is uh, whether you would think uh, this is useful, it could be useful. Of course, this is simplified. We may need more things here. We may need, um, it may depend on, again, on configuration, on conditional compilation, et cetera, et cetera, on, on key config, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the, the idea is to have different kinds of tests and use Rust, the Rust way, so to speak, of writing tests uh, very easily in the in the in, in the Rust side. Uh, and similarly, we could even think again for the doc tests, for documentation tests, we could also have these with attributes here uh, and do something similar as they do for the user space. Um, uh, yeah, that's basically it for, for me. I wanted to leave some time for discussion. Uh, there is also tooling. We can also discuss about tooling. Uh, I didn't put anything there because I wanted to have some discussion. But uh, there is also other tooling in, in Rust. Uh, we can we can see if you want this. Uh, there is tooling for testing. There is a uh, fuzzing library. There is uh, MIDI to test uh, unsafe code uh, when you have a test. That, uh, so it's an interpreter of uh, an intermediate representation. Uh, there is also a Rubra, I think it's called uh, it's a new tool for static analysis. So I just I, I, I can look at the name and put it in the chat uh, later. But this static analysis. So there are some tools that are appearing. Um, also for testing, et cetera, et cetera. So there is quite already an ecosystem for, for us on testing. We also had a talk from um, Alistair Ray from Google on uh, formal tools, and he was using keys uh, to, to to test the abstractions, et cetera, et cetera, that we have in the kernel so far. But uh, yeah, the question is, um, how do we turn the mic? Uh, there's a button in the, in the bottom middle of the screen. Yeah, so the discussion basically for the experts on, on testing, et cetera, et cetera, I would like to ask you, do you see a value on, the main question is, do you see value on on, um, on using the Rust native way of, of testing? This is something, basically, having this, and let me put that slide because perhaps it's the most interesting, having these kind of attributes uh, would take some work, uh, but I think um, it's reasonable to have, uh, it's not, I think, too much work. Uh, we need, perhaps, to there is some questions about how do we put it upstream, how do we customize this, but uh, it's, I think it's possible. Uh, so if people think it's, it's useful and uh, the key unit and self test maintainers perhaps don't uh, think we are uh, overstepping a bit on the, <laughs> we are not duplicating, we don't want to duplicate the, the testing. So, testing, right? sorry, I think, um, uh, I, I think we have to understand what it is that you're proposing first, you know, are you planning to run um, existing self tests and K unit on Rust kernel, or you're plan proposing writing tests in Rust? I guess I don't fully understand uh, so this what you're proposing. Okay, so this is 
will be intended to, to, to test Rust code only. So that's the first thing. So it is good only test Rust code, of course, or not, uh, not basically not trying to use this to test C code. So that's, uh, so this is only for Rust code. And second, um, uh, if I understood you correctly, um, this, uh, so th there is the two kinds of tests I, I mentioned. One is the documentation test, so it's just as a nice feature to test documentation, etc. But then there is all the other tests. So basically, instead of using key unit and self test, we will use this on the Rust side instead of writing key unit uh, tests. And uh, so basically, we will be not using that infrastructure in the Rust side. I don't know if that answers the question or if you have, uh, please, please ask me again if I didn't understand the, the question correctly. Uh, let's continue the conversation in chat. Looks like um, Brandon and David are getting ready to uh, do their presentation. Uh, I think yeah, we've, oh. we've still got a bit of time, but. Uh, yeah, I, I actually I wanted to before. ask questions about uh, uh, the Russ presentation, but uh, D David, you, you got on first, so. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I think there's sort of almost two halves to, to this. Do we want to write tests in Rust and test code in Rust? Which I think the answer is almost certainly yes. And then there's, you know, is this exact mechanism of the, the normal way Rust uh, tests are written the, the right thing? Which, you know, I, I don't think there's a, a really good argument against at this point, but it's certainly different from what yeah. Uh, tests written in C are. Yeah. As things are from, from the slide you've got up now, basically the user, you know, the host tests presumably are what you've already got working. The, yeah, the exactly. Those are tests, tests, yeah, exactly. Basically seem to be effectively where K self test currently kind of exists, you know. Um, code that, that runs in user space and pretend then pokes the, the, the running kernel. And uh, the kernel ones basically are where K units currently sit exactly. of code. Yeah, this will be integrated in the with, uh, yeah, exactly. White sort of, uh, you know, digging in white box testing. Um, I presume there are, are ways you could get, you know, um, Rust to automatically convert these into the, the appropriate binaries, you know, modules, et cetera, um, uh, programs that you know, uh, could have a uh, K self test sort of wrapper script or something that, that then run. Um, so I think that's probably sort of one half of it. How do you convert this into something that's automatically? Yeah, let's, let's assume we can do it. Let's assume we can do it. Yeah. So let, let's, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, the, the, the implementation may have. We may take a while because perhaps we need some features that we may ask upstream, or we need some way to customize these attributes and how the compiler, yeah, there is a bunch of things to do. But basically the, quest, the main question I think is, if we can do it, would you like to have this? And would you think we are like, it's a problem duplicating in a sense the, I mean, it's not duplicating in the sense that there is no way to really from C easily test Rust code anyhow. Uh, because of the different languages, if you want to test some types in Rust, etc., it's, it's not really easy to test from Rust from so from C. Sorry. So, if you think this is worth, basically the question is, do you think if this is worth it? Uh, this also integrates, as you said, it integrates key unit self test and, and the host test all in one. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that would be great. I mean, when when I first uh, started working on key unit, I really wanted to be able to run uh k unit tests as like individual binaries that didn't depend but basically kind of like your host test but um i i abandoned that idea pretty quickly just because i realized that like the, the there there's just the the kernel uh there's so many dependencies in the kernel and it's so difficult to isolate them um i mean i think it would be great if they could be isolated over time but you do occasionally come across bits and pieces where i think that's doable and being able to run those as like one of your host tests would be really cool. Um, I, I I think this was really exciting uh, to me just because I think I think like you know these, yeah. these tests look really, would you know if you could get this working it would be really really nice uh, for for Rust users. But also I think that this is um, 
you know, could kind of compel uh, maybe like a parallel C sort of interface mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, I, I, I think we've seen like, there, there was one instance where somebody recently posted a K unit test uh, to the mailing list where it probably should have been a K self test, but they really seem like they wanted to write it as a K unit test because like they liked the interface for K unit better, but it should have been like, it actually should have been run from user space. And I, I think that if we had like a consistent interface, then you don't have to pick really. Okay. Like you just write the test in the way that makes sense and then you run it where it makes sense. And those are two decoupled ideas, which I think, I think is a, it would be awesome. Um, so I, I would, I'm actually, I, I hope you're able to get this working and I hope we. Oh, yeah, that, that's yeah. great. That's basically great. Yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. That's what I will get, basically. <laughs> yeah, just as long as we get a parallel C interface out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll need the, yeah, yeah. Uh, we will need to modify the, I guess, the, the somehow, if we are going to use attributes in the C size as well, we will need to modify the C compiler or whatever, or, or have a plugin for the CC perhaps. I don't know. I don't exactly know. But yeah. I think um, sort of the the yeah. next obvious steps here from from my point of view are so the the two problems that need solving are one can you write things like k unit modules from Rust even if you don't have all this syntactic sugar first as sort of a you know get a a test that you know can be used as a k unit test linked into the the kernel you know, everything's there because KUnit currently requires a few macros for sort of putting things in linker sections and that, get that sort of stuff working. Um, and then you can look at sort of adding this this syntactic sugar on top to, to automatically generate those. Um, and the second thing is there'll need to be some working out of how do you work out what all of the tests are named from KUnit's point of view? Um, do you need some way of, you know, grouping them into suites. Do you need some way of yeah. being able to put the suite set up? Uh, we could have here, there. like extra information here. Uh, we could have extra information here to put other metadata or suites or yeah. grouping, or even grouping by the module. Like you saw before, the basis of the module, we could even use the modules to group things. I mean, there are, there are different possibilities, but uh, yeah. Uh, I, there, there's also two ways of doing this, like independently of the key unit, etc., which I don't think, of course, you want. <laughs> Uh, like this basically creating our own solution for doing this. Uh, and then there is the other way, which is generating the key unit test automatically from this code, which mm -hmm. is also possible. And we could even do it perhaps with pro macros. I don't know. Um, pro macros in class is, so is basically a program, it's a plugin that compiler compiles on the fly and then runs it inside the compiler. So it's like a plugin for the compiler that is written in Rust and is automatically executed. So it, perhaps we could also do it like that. But yeah. Mm. Uh, Speaking of key units, it's now time for the key unit talks. So <laughs> thanks a lot, Tim. Thank you. Thank you uh, for joining me here. Uh, even with the overload of Rust talks, uh, so thank you for coming as well. <laughs> it sounds like okay. the beginning of a really good discussion about how to run tests in a more generic way. Uh, who wants to be presenter first, Brendan or David? Uh, yeah, we're kind of like switching back and forth. So um, like there's some one, sections that... Only one person can switch the slides unless... Okay, well, we actually practice right. with me, like, switching the slides, yeah. so I'll... I'll Brendan will do that, and I'll yeah. yell at him. Oops. Um. Yeah. Okay, now I should be able to switch slides. Yep, I, all right, it looks like it. Cool. Uh, okay, there we go. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brennan. I'm here with my colleague, uh, David. We work on KUnit. Um, and we're going to be talking about uh, what we've been doing over the last year and what we hope to do in the future to uh, uh, expand KUnit's uh, usage. Whoops. Gotten used to hitting the keyboard. Um, so uh, we're going to divide this talk into roughly four sections. We're going to talk about the just the pure numbers of the growth we've seen in the last year. Um, we're going to talk about uh, some of the blockers and problems that we face that we've tried to address and we're trying to address. Um, then we're going to talk about some of the features we added in the last year to um, address some of those problems. Um, but a lot of the problems and feature uh, problems and issues we're facing right now um, don't really have technical solutions. So we're going to talk about some of the non-technical 
uh, growth efforts. So um, uh, I've been really, really happy to see the, uh, the amount of growth we've seen last year. We've seen overall about a, a th uh, om almost a, a three times increase um, in the amount of tests, uh, depending on whether you me uh, measure by individual test files or whether you measure by test cases. But one thing that I've, I've been really excited to see is the amount of people who've contributed to a test has, has increased by over a factor of five. Um, uh, this is a plot that shows the test cases per release. Um, I think there's a pretty strong linear growth trend here, um, a lot of momentum there. So that's something that's, that's really exciting. Um, I'm not gonna really talk about this slide. People can look at it if you want. Uh, I just realized that there's useful information here, but it kind of takes too long to explain. Um, so there are a number of new K unit tests that have been introduced in roughly the last year. Uh, again, we're not gonna go through all of them for time, but uh, you know, th there's a good list. Uh, one of the interesting things uh, that you will note is that a lot of these are tests for new features that have been uh, introduced to the kernel, like Daemon, the, the data access monitor, um, or parsers of some kind. Um, a lot of the stuff in the, the Thunderbolt topology, Alpha SOC topology, the FAT file system stuff is parser related, or library code of some kind, like the rational number stuff. Um, so interesting stuff but that tend to be constrained in what areas they are. Uh, next slide, Bernard. So there are basically a number of things that are blocking people from using KUnit or stopping people from immediately uh, uh, deciding KUnit is what they want to use right now. Um, <laughs> KUnit is basically as a result of being a unit testing framework, really good at testing isolated library-like code uh, that doesn't have a lot of dependencies. Uh, basically anything pure functional or you know parsing or the like uh, is is really easy to work with anything that has a lot of access to you know global kernel functions hardware state um, is a bit more difficult uh, to work with and this is generally true of, of unit testing because that's not really what unit testing is traditionally about but it's also what a lot of the kernel is um, and that means in the past architecture, hardware dependent tests have been a little bit more difficult to work with. Um, there's also been just some areas of KUnit that have not handled it perfectly. Uh, KUnit tool, which is our wrapper script has only supported running tests via UML, uh, user mode Linux, uh, but a lot of drivers would not build against UML. Um, sometimes dependencies for things like multi-core systems that some tests needed were only known about at runtime. Uh, and equally, it's been a little bit tricky to actually configure what tests you want to build and run. Um, particularly, what we want to nice if you trying to test a subsystem or some particular area, you want a quick way of saying run all the tests that are relevant to that. Um, and finally, it's been really tricky for people to work out when you should use KUnit versus when you should use KSelf test versus when you should use either some other framework or just write a module to test your thing. Um, and making that clearer to people, as well as providing feature parity and compatibility with these other test frameworks so that you can pick based on what's best for the test, not based on this supports my weird system better, or I understand the output format here, or this uses tabs instead of spaces and I like it better. Um, you know, it makes sure that people can pick the, the actual best framework for the job. Uh, next slide. All right, so now we're going to talk about some of the new features that we've uh, added uh, in the last year to address some of those problems. Uh, so the first thing, uh, like David just mentioned, uh, uh, KUnit tool uh, did not support anything outside of UML. To be clear, the core library has always worked against every architecture supported by the kernel since it was merged um, upstream, but uh, our um, a wrapper script, which we use for automating or ma making it easier to configure build and run tests um, has only supported UML just because UML is a much more constrained environment. Uh, arbitrary kernels are not very constrained. Um, but now to address some of to alleviate some of that pain, we added uh, QMU support to KUnit tool. And uh, 
uh, for, for normal things, it's it's pretty straightforward to use. All you have to do, it works the same way as Knit tool normally does. You just have to add these two additional arguments, um, uh, arc and specify your uh, toolchain prefix. And it, um, it builds your uh, uh, kernel um, just like it normally would under UML uh, or configures it, builds it. Um, runs it and then extracts the results. Um, so uh, we we support uh, these architectures currently right out of the box. I think this covers most of the, the really popular ones. Uh, no offense to anyone who's not on this list. Uh, if you don't see your architecture here, um, it's the writing one of these configs is, is really, really easy to do. Um, there's a number of examples to refer to. Um, but nevertheless, if you would like to, if you'd like to do that, just reach out to us and we'll help you do it. No problem. So one of the other features that has been added in the last year is support for skipping tests. So again, this is for cases where tests have dependencies or hardware requirements that you can't handle just by adding a dependency to your kconfig entry, um, particularly things that aren't known until runtime. Um, so the solution to that is, you know, if your test is running and it finds that it no longer makes sense to run this test because you know some dependency is not satisfied or something similar, the test can just skip itself. Uh, and an example here is KCSAN, the, the kernel concurrency sanitizer, only really makes sense on an SMP multi-core system. Um, so those tests will skip themselves if you write a run them on a single core machine. Um, the KTAP specification, which we'll get to uh, provides a way of outputting tests that are skipped, and this is what case self test is used for a while. Uh, next slide. Uh, using the skip test stuff is pretty easy. There's a macro k unit skip. Uh, it prints results out in you know a sensible font. It's the same as what k uh, self test uses, and if you use the tooling, you get it in a nice color. Uh, next slide. Um, Another thing that we've added support for the, the KUnit tool is um, using what we call .KUnit config fragments, which is basically a way of specifying a pre-done set of uh, KConfig configurations um, for testing a particular subsystem or area. So basically, instead of having to go and edit this config file manually, um, different subsystems can provide a pre-written KUnit config list of dependencies for tests and test configs that need to run. Um, and you can use the KUnit or PI run KUnit config argument and pass it the directory or the config file, and it will build and configure and, and run that um, automatically. Uh, next slide. Uh, for a more granular way of looking at um, tests that you want to run, uh, we're adding support for being able to filter what tests run via a glob. Uh, currently, you can filter by suite. So if you just want to run the example suite, you can use KUnit or PI run, you know, example star, and it will run every test that starts with the suite that starts with example. Um, if you want to run, say, just the list delete tests, we're adding support. It's being, you know, reviewed will be in the, the next version, hopefully. Um, for filtering the tests as well as the suites. So you could glob on the list k unit test dot anything with Dell in it and get just the linked list deletion tests. Um, this can be run directly from the kernel or via k unit tool, but it doesn't really make sense if you're using modules because uh, in that case, you're already just running the things that you uh, are loaded. Uh, next slide. Um, also, we've added test statistic support. This is basically just a feature parity thing with um, case self test and, and other test modules. Um, basically, a lot of uh, test modules and the like uh, printed summaries of how many tests passed, failed, skipped, etc. And while KUnit could do this, it was part of this Python wrapper script KUnit tool rather than part of the internal framework. Uh, and so, if you were using things as a module or not running it through KUnit tool, uh, you didn't get that and someone would have to go and count all of the tests manually to, to get that count. Uh, and this was a regression when we were porting tests from, uh, you know, random sort of ad hoc test modules to KUnit, uh, suddenly the output was a little less useful. So we now have output, it's based on something that's K, the way KSelfTest uh, prints out outputs. 
it's a little bit different to handle nested tests properly that are uh, otherwise, you know, uh, no longer a blocker for people. Uh, next slide. All right, so um, one of the other things we've done, I, this, this is kind of transitioning into the, the less uh, feature related, um, less technical things that we've worked on. Uh, we, we've added a, uh, well, I should say David added a kernel testing guide, um, which uh, currently it, it tries to delineate some of the cases where you should use KUnit versus KSelf test. Um, it's not exhaustive, but it's a good start. We're, we're hoping um, that we can and other people will expand this over time and also include testing tools other than KUnit and KSelfTest to create basically in the future a comprehensive uh, guide where if someone wants to test some code for the kernel, they go there and it tells them uh, either what to do or where to look for further information. Um, we also have a tech writer uh, working on improving our KUnit uh, documentation. Um, Um, so, uh, uh, now, now we're going to talk about some of the other non-technical, um, things we've been trying to do to grow cane its adoption. So one of these things and quite a big and important thing that's come up a little bit, uh, earlier today is what we call KTAP standardization. Basically both KUnit and KSelfTest and a few other things are using variants on TAP, which is the test anything protocol as a format for test results. Uh, and TAP is pretty sparse, you know, originally intended for Perl stuff, didn't really provide everything that we needed um, uh, for kernel testing. Uh, in particular, we wanted to have nested test support. TAP originally didn't want to um, support that. Uh, KSelfTest and KUnit for you know, reasons that seemed sensible at the time, um, sort of implemented these slightly differently and in incompatible ways. So tools like KUnit tool uh, in particular really could only parse the exact result format that KUnit could provide. Um, and what we want and, you know, what uh, uh, people like uh, Tim Burton that have started is to standardize um, a kernel variation of TAP um, for, in kernel and, and, you know, certainly in kernel tree tests um, so that, you know, we can share tooling. Uh, <coughs> and basically the idea is any parser should be able to handle K self testing K unit results basically indistinguishably. Uh, we've had a uh, Ray, one of our interns working to rework the K unit tool parser to support some of the things that K unit doesn't use, but K self test does. Um, and uh, she's also helped sort of get the ball rolling a bit again with some of the standardization work, which has been a bit stop start uh, over the last year. Uh, next slide. Um, so like David mentioned uh, with, uh, with Ray, we've uh, also been hosting uh, interns and not in the past year, but also LKMP mentees. Um, since the start of uh, KUnit, we've hosted uh, 12, including all interns and in LKMP mentees. Um, uh, we've only hosted uh, two in the last year, but um, I, I wanted to mention the LKMP mentees because of the, the next slide. But, um, uh, you know, of course, it's always good to have, uh, have interns uh, working on the kernel because it promotes uh, you know, kernel development and open source development to the next generation of engineers. Uh, but also, you know, we're kind of hoping to, uh, you know, s somewhat indoctrinate them with uh, uh, good testing practices um, when, when, and hopefully they become uh, software and uh, uh, full time software engineers. Um, on a related note, we also, um, presented at the uh, Linux Foundation Mentorship Series, which is another uh, talk series that's kind of targeted at uh, new uh, 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 software engineers who are just starting uh, working on the, the Linux kernel. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, the, the LKMP uh, mentee, I, I wanted to specifically call that out because uh, one thing I was really excited to see um, that a group of students uh, organized the KUnit hackathon. And, and they did this totally of their own volition, but 
uh, one thing I noticed was that one one of uh, my uh, one of our former LKMP mentees was there, and I, I suspect that's not a coincidence. So um, that that was a really really cool thing to see, and uh, I, I'm really in particular excited about that. And uh, you know, I'm I think we're we're all pretty happy with what we saw them do um, so far, uh, but. Uh, they they seem to think that it worked worked out well for them as well, and they're planning on doing a, another hackathon uh, in the future. Um, they wanted to do some things other than test conversion, so we introduced them to uh, the DRM subsystem maintainer Daniel Vetter, and it seems like there's uh, there's some strong potential that uh, there might be a hackathon where uh, they're going to work on some DRM subsystem uh, tests. So. Uh, it'd be great if we can do uh, work on other subsystems in the future as well, or sorry, they, they, they can work on some other subsystems as well in their hackathons. So if anyone has any uh, subsystems you would like to have some, some student hackers work on your, uh, uh, help develop some tests for you, you should uh, reach out and I'll, I'll put them in contact. And it actually looks like we have one of them in the chat, so you can probably reach out to An uh, Andre. Uh, so one of the, the final things we want to talk about is faking and mocking and basically how we handle testing code with hardware or complex dependencies. It's, uh, a theme throughout this is this is difficult, and this is also one of the things that everyone seems to immediately go, this is why I can't test my driver. Um, and in general, the solution for this with unit testing is that you replace the dependencies or hardware or whatever with, with fakes of some kind. So instead of talking to real hardware, you implement basically a fake device, which will respond in, in a certain way, depending on the test. Um, and you can have several of these ones that, you know, always errors or, or one that uh, actually sort of emulates the device a bit more thoroughly. Um, and the, I, you know, similarly global functions, you know, allocation functions, trying to read files or, or read blocks from block devices. These are things that a lot of the code in the kernel, um, you know, directly needs to call these functions. And it's very difficult to totally remove them and replace them um, because you need them for the kernel to run. But at the same time, you want to be able to sort of intercept that and say, hey, I'm trying to test, you know, file system parsing. I need some way of, um, you know, intercepting a block device read or refactoring code so that I don't need to intercept a, a block device read. Um, we've written, um, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Daniel's written a, a great doc on uh, sort of different ways you can intercept functions on the, the KUnit website at that link. Um, but one of the things we've tried in the past is implementing a, a sort of more full mocking framework and just with the way C and, and kernel uh, development works, it's not you know trivial to do this in a way that's actually useful in all of the cases people expect it's going to be useful. So that's kind of on hold at the moment. And really, what you know we've discovered is most subsystems and areas you you need to write bespoke sort of fake devices or, or fake implementations, and then maybe we can work out that some of them will be uh, you know useful to share between more devices. Uh, so, next slide. Um, one of the things that we're, we're starting to do and looking into doing um, is trying to find subsystems and drivers and file systems and the like um, where, you know, we and others can, can go and basically say, okay, we can test, you know, library-like code really easily. Let's, let's chip away at these and start trying to test the more difficult bits rather than just going after the, the easy parts. Um, so one of the ideas here is taking, say, for example, you know, ext4 or another file system uh, where we've already got, you know, tests for um, timestamp conversion, which is, you know, very independent and working out, okay, how do we, we test the, the more complicated and um, trickier bits like uh, do we need to write fake inode structures or fake super blocks or have a fake way of reading blocks from the block device? Um, or is it better to make more elaborate fake things here? Or is it better to refactor the code so that instead of uh, calling these functions, it accepts things more as an argument and it's easier to test? 
Um, so that's something we're looking to do. Uh, got, I've got some experiments on local machines that haven't got very far yet. Um, and uh, certainly interested to see what, what people think of that. Um, and with that, uh, we'll open, open the uh, floor up to discussion because, you know, what has it been that stopped people from, from writing care unit tests or being difficult or questions you don't have uh, answers to? And does this seem like a sensible path? Have we done the right thing, wrong thing? What do you think? Um, so I, I put some, oh, cool. We got someone. Uh, Guillaume, it sounds like you're muted. It was hard to unmute. Uh, sorry, look, uh, um, yeah, <laughs> of course, I'm interested in uh, having this running in kernel CI and thanks to your work, it's 80% done. Uh, there's still a few things missing. But I wonder if other systems are running KUnit automatically because adding a KUnit test, if people run it manually, it's useful, but if there's some system somewhere that runs it automatically and reports issues, that's even more useful. Um, so LKFT is running KUnit tests. Um, under QEMU for x86 and ARM64. Um, so those are being run automatically, um, uh, including some of the ones like the KASAN tests that can't run under UML at the moment. Um, we also have like a little kind of experimental thing uh, that uploads uh, patches sent to the K self test list to Garrett. And uh, we run uh, KUnit tests as pre submit uh, against that Garrett instance as well. And do you think there's anything else in this space that could be done to provide an incentive for people to add more tests? Because, uh, you know, if something breaks, it becomes more visible if the errors are reported directly. I don't know. Um, so, sorry, uh, which, which part, like, are, what, what part are you saying should be more visible? Uh, if tests are run automatically, like if LFKFT is running KUnit automatically and an error is found, then it's more publicly visible and so it has a bigger impact than, you know, if a test right. is there, it relies on people to do it by hand. So do you think there's more that can be done in this area to run it more or share the results um, more? Yeah, probably. I, I think that right now, like getting the tests, uh, getting the test configured to run is kind of a pain. Uh, LKFT um, sets an option, which uh, I think it's called KUnit tests all. I forget the exact name off the top of my head, but uh, most KUnit tests enable it. And if all the dependencies for the test are satisfied and that option is selected, the test will automatically be turned on. Um, so basically all you have to, as long as your, the dependencies for your test are enabled in a kernel, it'll run on LKFT, but of course LKFT, you know, they care about x86 and, and ARM. So if your test doesn't run on one of those architectures, uh, then it, it's not going to get run. And so I think there's a lot more work that could probably be done there to make sure your, your tests actually run. Um, but I think it's hard because it, that that basically means everyone's has to create like their own config, and I, I I don't know that this is something that'll happen in the short term. But maybe the subsystem configs that uh, David mentioned earlier in the talk could ho hopefully maybe help with that in some way. Yeah, one thing on that front that we'd we'd really like is for you know subsystem maintainers and the like to be able to say, hey, look, you know, this is the the .k unit config for our subsystem, you know, when code is submitted, you should run it against this. We will run it against this when testing it. Um, and you should, if you write tests that are enabled by that, we know they'll be getting run. Um, uh, okay. I, I see, see there's a discussion in the uh, a chat around um, adding basically uh, expectations for, for D message output and, and sort of uh, intercepting a, and expecting certain things to be printed on the console. Um, so that's something that uh, 
yeah, a, a couple of tests have, have looked into doing um, and doing in general. I think there's a sort of uh, idea here of we don't want to add things to the, the K unit framework until we're sure there are, are users and ideally more than one user. Um, so it, it sounds like, yeah, there, there are more multiple people using this um, and merging it in will probably, uh, you know, that, that's, that's a good start for, you know, maybe this should be, be something that we include as part of K unit or in a, a common place for the tests to use. Um, but uh, it's equally easy to get burnt by, you know, having to write a, a new feature generically for everything rather than get your, your test working. We can always factor things out later. Uh, just wanted to say it's uh, normally the, the end of the microconf now, so I guess people can still carry on talking, but I wanted to say thanks to all the uh, presenters we had today. And of course, tomorrow we have a related topic, uh, microconference about uh, um, kernel dependability and assurance. And I have to say the difference between that and, the, and this microconf is a bit fuzzy to me. <laughs> so we'll be talking about more testing things tomorrow. Uh, Sasha, is there anything you wanted to add? I just wanted to thank all the folks who presented here and participated. Um, it was another great year, and hopefully we'll uh, meet in person next year. We'll see. So I, I free to stay here and keep discussing the slide. Yeah, the server is not going to shut down anytime soon, so it's fine. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think David and I are able to hang around. I mean, I, I certainly am if anyone wants to give any sugge further suggestions or advice or complaints or concerns about KUnit or, you know, yeah. particularly ideally around things we could do to, to help, you know, make it easier and uh, and grow the user base. But, um, you know. Um, yeah, if, if get a word in. Um, so I, I try use it's been since I've looked at it, but I try using a unit for uh, regnap and found it was fairly laborious to do thing with it. Um, it's been a while, but I, th I think the the main issues I had were working out how to expose the internals of the API to the unit tests and not to anybody else. Um, so, I, um, so I didn't get people doing um, things uh, with the attractions, uh, and also um, I couldn't work out a nice way to set up uh, test fixtures. Um, the, it didn't seem like KUnit was really helping me with that. I was having to open code it. Um, that might have changed because it was quite, a, or one or both of those might have changed. Because it was quite a while. Over with this. Um, but yeah, it, it just felt like a lot of work to get the coverage I was looking for for that sort of in binary testing. Yeah, I and mean, on the first point, it's partly just one of the, the realities of uh, working with C in the kernel that it can be really awkward to try to expose functions to just your tests in a way that's not ugly. So we have some solutions to that, but they're all ugly in some way. Um, yeah. The uh, yeah, page... I, I don't I don't know if it's if it's like I I, I think part of what I was thinking there was that um, having a way of annotating things, like even if it wasn't like technically hidden from anything. Uh, just mm. a way of annotating things that would scream at people or something, or at least jump out somehow um, that it was supposed to be for KUnit. Uh, but I, it felt like I was having to freelance on that, and I wasn't. There wasn't anything that KUnit was helping me annotate. Yeah. At this point, basically, what we've been been doing is either yeah, you include your tests basically directly in the, the same file so that they can access, you know, static functions, or you have a whole bunch of custom, yeah, if def config, whatever test, or sometimes config K unit, define whatever, you know, static or define whatever, nothing. Um, 
uh, as a way of doing that, which, you know, it is a bit ugly. Um, uh, it's one of those things, again, where there are few enough tests already doing this that, um, <coughs> you know, we, we haven't seen to some extent that, that need. Um, but uh, certainly, and certainly there's not one solution to this that fits everyone, which uh, works, but, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll definitely take it on board. Um, I did send out a patch at some point. Um, it, I, we didn't merge it because um, n there wasn't anyone who looked like they, they wanted to use it, but um, it does basically what, what David just described, where um, it, it's basically a macro that replaces static on functions. And the function is basically static if KUnit is not present, and it is not static if it is present. So it basically allows you to export a function outside of a compilation unit only if you're going to test it. But uh, you know it's pretty ugly, um, and you know it, it's it seemed like at the time the only use ca motivating use case. They, they were more amenable to just having us include the tests directly in their um, in, in the uh, the file that they were testing um, so um, but but yeah I mean if if that's if that's a, a, a pro I, I don't know if that would help you in any way um, to to address the second part of your problem um, uh, what, what was the second part again Fixtures, text test fixtures. You didn't find that the test init test uh, was it clean out or is it tear down uh, in the test suite um, like fulfilled that need? Um, no, um, I can't. Um, are those per test or are they? They're per test. Yeah, I think I think it was wanting to. Uh, reuse it, reuse the thing over multiple tests was part of the uh, the issue. Um, yeah, we had we had somebody suggest a patch which would um, set it up at the tar start of a test suite and then tear it down at the end of the test suite, so yeah. you could reuse things like what you suggested. Um, but uh, that patch set didn't go in, um, and because he was the only user of that feature, it didn't go in. So, um, you know, again, if that's a feature that people want, it would be a pretty, pretty trivial to just go and find that patch and merge it in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah something like that would would help, or um, like e even being able to do that on a more fine grained bit with you know groups of tests. Like you know, here I will test feature X. Here I will make a dummy feature X to test it with. Uh, now I'll run the test. Now I will stop running the tests. Um, well, the, you know, the, the, the that extra level uh, might not might be more trouble than it's worth because uh, it's only really saving you a bit of memory rather than anything else. Yeah, one of the the sort of conflicts there is ideally you want the tests to be as independent as possible, um, so that uh, effectively you know you can skip tests or you know do the like without yeah. having global state that can be mutated by several tests and the order that they run suddenly matters or or the like. Mm. So it, it's sort of something that we've not really, you know, put a lot of thought into into that's how the, the sort of system's designed. But there are definitely cases where it's much more convenient and, and we yeah. can note that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you could always, if you had a way of sitting, uh, say some, you know, say something like here is the uh, here are the creation and destruction functions for um, this group of tests, and then you could always just run the creation and destruction function before and after every test. Like the, the, yeah. the it was it was the repetitiveness that was uh, an issue more than the, uh, and having a way to pass the state into the test more than the. Um, so, um, like as a performance or memory use or whatever thing or. Um... I, it was more like I was having to specify the same thing over and over and over, or do the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah, I mean, 
we'd, we'd hope most cases that would sort of be handled by yeah, the, the suite initialization and shutdown functions and you just make several suites, which you can do quite easily within the same file. Um, and, you know, there are downsides to having lots of suites in terms of, okay, now you've suddenly got a, a whole bunch of different suites that might not be the way you wanted to organize things. Um, but on the whole, uh, that's a, you know, pretty reasonable way of doing it. Um, yeah, I think th I was, it, I, I was using suites for something else already. So I, I think I wanted to nest it two mm. layers was the, uh, I, it's been a while and I think I threw away the patches cause they're a bit rotted. Um, but I, I think, I think the issue I was having was that they were the, uh, with, with that was that it was, uh, I wanted two la uh, layers of things. Yeah, we've been edging a little bit further towards allowing more interesting levels of nesting. Um, one of the new features that, that we haven't mentioned during the, the talk is parameterized testing, where you can run the same test function with a bunch of different arguments. And that sort of acts kind of like an extra layer. The KTAP standardization stuff and reworking around the, the tools there, one of the major part of there is making sure much of the KUnit stack actually has this concept of more arbitrarily nested tests. Um, so that, you know, if that becomes useful, you know, it's something we can support more. Um, but in a lot of cases, um, again, you know, you can just use test in it, you know, splitting things up into to more smaller suites and just naming the suites something that makes it it obvious that they're related has been the the sort of go to thing in a lot of cases that's worked in um, in many many situations and you can have several suites in the same test module and same config option um, which sort of is kind of a level of nesting even if it's not in the, the mm. result format um, yeah, uh, we'll uh, definitely uh, notice get something get back to you uh, about what the more concretely about was Uh, but it, it, sound, it sounds like the, the uh, one or both or you know some of those ideas might help move forward a bit. Yeah, I, I think some I think some some of those things are new since I looked at it. It was very early on that I looked at it. Yeah, a few things on on that front have changed, but uh, I think yeah, the certainly the the parameterized testing stuff and that's uh, needed. Yeah. Um, so I, I was, uh, wh while you were discussing that, I was responding to uh, Ira um, asked about the, the static thing. Um, is there anyone else who would find the um, visible for testing macro useful? Um, it just seemed like in the past, everyone was okay. Everyone who had that situation was okay with having the uh, Kunit tests just included within um, optionally included within the compilation unit that contained the static functions. Um, so I, I think to be clear, it sounds like that's kind of the preferred um, mode that Rust uh, wants to wants to take. Um. And the problem with with okay. doing that is you don't end up with a separate module for your tests if you want to do things with modules. Um, right. And on the other hand, the problem with doing this sort of visible for testing macro is uh, that's either static or not, is you still need to have the um, function declaration somewhere, so the, the signature so that your test code can access it, which for a right. st static function you might not have otherwise bothered doing. Uh, or putting in some public place. So you need to have an extra copy of that. There is no really nice solution to this problem. Um, and there's no reason equally we can't have both solutions available. Um, right, right. Um, we've, we've just had some features. Well, actually, I think at this point, all the features that we've added have pretty much been used. But 
I mean, there are definitely a, like some features that I think like only one person uses that, and uh, it's I a think... chicken and egg problem. Of yeah, you know, you don't want to add these things and then have no one use them because it's it's silly just having patches that add macros that no one uses. Um, yeah, but no one writes the test that would use it if it's not already there. Um, so definitely, if you've got tests where this sort of thing is necessary, either write it yourself, drop it in your, you know, add it as part of the, the test. It's, you know, something like this would, we'd be more than happy to add um, or, or reach out to us and we can, we can sort of coordinate and, and get these things in. Yeah, but I, I think in these cases, both the things that Mar uh, Mark brought up, I think it seems like there's probably enough interest because yeah. I think they've been brought up a couple of times. So I think we should probably just add those in now, mm -hmm. especially since the patch already exists. Um, any anything else anyone wants to discuss? Uh, also, thanks for sharing that example, Ira. That looks mm -hmm. that that was yeah, it seems like a very similar situation. Um, I saw somebody, I, I think it was Felicitas, uh, started to type something. Um, is there anything else anyone wants to discuss? Say, um, give it 30 seconds. If some, if anyone wants to discuss anything, uh, speak now or um, I think we'll or just talk out. in the chat or send an email at some point. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah, this is, this is going to be open. I think and there's plenty of people who are who are here. So um well, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, can I, since I have presentation ability, can I add somebody else as a presenter? Manage presentations. Uh, uh okay, it'll let me select presentations, but it won't. Let me add new presenters, maybe. Um, who's yeah, the person who said that? It wasn't supposed to work. Then, uh... Well, I'm I'm gonna pick on on David on an experiment. See if I can make you get make you. I can give you whiteboard access. Exciting. Um, I I guess. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay, we're just going to keep playing with the uh, glue button until we break it, unless people have actual questions. So. Yeah, I clicked on uh, I clicked on David, and it just the only option I, I have is give whiteboard access. Um, I can give you a whiteboard access too. Doesn't appear to have done anything on my end, but uh... okay. Settings. Maybe it's because I didn't set this up. It, it looks like there are people. You might be able to go to the main uh, chat room, the element chat matrix element, whatever you want to call it, chat room. They might be able to grant you presentation there. Oh, in the on the left side. Yeah, all right. I'm on the left side. Um, and let, you said it's you click over the person's name. Hmm. No, I don't know. Sorry. Um, in any case, it's uh, after lunchtime for me. So. Uh, um. Oh. Looks like Jonathan's in the room, and I saw he was given in the main element chat room. He uh, did something with whiteboard access. He might know what to do. I guess he's not listening. 
All right. Well, anyway, I'm going to head out. So um, anyone else here, uh, feel free to chat. Um, sorry, I wasn't able to give uh, uh, grant presentation abilities to someone else. Oh, I wonder if, if I take my, no, OK. All right, well, anyway, I'm going to head out. Hey, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everyone. and. Uh... Do feel free to um, reach out either through this or email at the, the K unit or K self test mailing lists. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll monitor those and answer any questions you have. <laughs>